I called to order the regular session of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, July 11th, 2023 at 6.30 6 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Vatikiotis? Here. Vice Mayor Lunt? Here. Commissioner Eisner? Here. Commissioner Kouyas? Here. Commissioner Kouyanis? Here. Okay, this evening's invocation will be given by Reverend Lisa Bradford of the Church on the Bayou Presbyterian Church. If we can all rise and remain standing at the end of the invocation, we'll pledge allegiance to the flag. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for the privilege of living in democracy, often complicated, rarely dull. We ask God that your presence would be felt here powerfully and that there would be a spirit of cooperation, humility, and peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have some very special presentations to make tonight and recognitions. Um, I'm going to invite any of the commissioners that want to come up, if they'd like to come up. Uh, Commissioner Koulianis, I know you would like to come up. We've got um, some certificates of recognition for our centenarians. Um, these are very, very special people in Tarpon Springs. They've been here forever and um, in terms of history of the town. And they were born in the 1920s, and, um, and that means it's pretty much forever. Uh, so certainly they went through World War II and, and, and suffered a lot, and we are here where we are today. And it's a wonderful small town. It's still a small town, and this is what small towns do. They recognize their special people. Um, we have three individuals this evening, and uh, two of them we had intended to do back in October because that's when the birthdays were. But then we had Hurricane Ian pay us a visit where we actually thought we were going to have uh, Ian coming down Tarpon Avenue. That didn't happen, but nevertheless, we postponed a lot of things. And it took us up to about this point to get organized again uh, to make these presentations. So let me go ahead and get started. And there's nothing formal about this. Um, you know, I, I know I was born and raised here. I know you all. So as far as photographs and things, if, if uh, you want to bring people up when we call you up, please do so. The first person we're going to recognize is Mrs. Lula Hulis Alexiu. <laughs> now, Mrs. Alexiu um, grew up on Division Street. My grandparents lived on Division Street, and um, in those days, uh, grandmothers were a very, very important part of the family. And when I was born, um, my grandmother wasn't too sure that my mother would be able to handle everything. So she took a very primary role in my rearing even as a small baby. And Mrs. Uh, Alexiu was in her 20s when I was born. So here we are 75 years later. <laughs> And this, we have two certificates this evening, a Centenarian Plus certificate and a Centenarian certificate. A couple of these folks here tonight, it's been a long time coming. We should have done this a long time ago. And I hope we remember that we're still a small town and we continue this into the future. Let me read this one. This is a Centenarian Plus certificate. On behalf of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, it is a pleasure to extend our best wishes to you on this truly wonderful occasion. May good health and happiness continue to be yours in the years ahead. Happy 104th birthday.
I also want to say um, Ms. Alexiou's birthday is in October. That will make it 105. Wow. So. I should say, Annette, um, Ms. Alexiou's daughter is a little younger than me, but I remember her when uh, she was growing up. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to say I'm old enough to be her father. <laughs> Our next certificate um, for me is also very special. <clears throat> In the sense I remember the name from high school, and the name is Nathaniel Crawford, Jr., who's sitting right over here. But tonight, it's Nathaniel Crawford Sr. that we're, we're honoring. Um, this also is a Centenarian Plus certificate. On behalf of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, it is a pleasure to extend our best wishes to you on this truly wonderful occasion. May good health and happiness continue to be yours in the years ahead. Happy 103rd birthday. Wow. to admit I don't have all the details for everybody in terms of uh, children great or great grandchildren children grandchildren great grandchildren so forth but I'm, I'm 75 years old and I've seen a lot and I've, I've met a lot of people but mr. Crawford senior Nate Crawford senior is the only person I know that has great great grandchildren Wow. Not great grandchildren, but great great grandchildren. <laughs> and also, um, oh, Tom does. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Miss Georgia Jefferson, I knew Georgia, who is Mr. Crawford's daughter. Um, when she worked at the city clerk's office when I was city manager in the late 1990s. So it's nice to see you again tonight, Georgia. Okay. Now our last certificate um, is a centenarian certificate. And I feel pretty good about this one. Um, my younger son chose Tarpon Springs as his home and um, his childhood friend is Ms. Hanyotis' grandson. So I see Mrs. Hanyotis all the time, and she's a very special part of just the Vaticotis family as well. And this is a centenarian certificate. On behalf, on behalf of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, it is a pleasure to extend our best wishes to you on this truly wonderful occasion. May good health and happiness continue to be yours in the years ahead. Happy 100th birthday, Helen. Thank you. Also, just a little secret, um, when I was a, a and my wife's listening, so I'll probably give something away that she doesn't know. Um, Ms. Senyotis used to vacation down here with her daughters and nieces on Clearwater Beach um, uh, for a, some period of time after the sponge industry died. The family moved up to Joliet, and now everybody's back down here. But it, it would always be those trips back to Tarpon Springs and Clearwater Beach, which was where you would go for kids to go swimming and things like that. And so that's where I first actually met Ms. Fignotis was, I guess, in the 1960s at that time when y'all would go down a vacation. Um, also, Mr. Koulianis is related to Ms. Fignotis, and he'd like to say a few words. Mayor, you're like a baby here tonight. 
<laughs> it's your 75. So uh, he gets nervous when I pull paper out. He doesn't know what's coming up. Two, two minutes. Two minutes. Oh, yeah. I, I, can, I can do it. I can do it. So um, it, Helen is the boss of our family. Um, she is my father's first cousin. Their fathers were brothers. And, you know, she is extremely special, and you can see her, that uh, beautiful people age beautifully. And that is you. You, she is a beautiful lady inside and out. She always, my brother Tom and I were speaking about that yesterday, that anytime we see her, she tells us she loves us. Um, and, and it's amazing. And when you think about the three recipients tonight, the city that they have, what they've seen in Tarpon Springs, like the mayor said, these are people born before the Great Depression and before World War II. Um, you've, and your folks have seen uh, a lot of, with civil rights and the things that were going on in, in Tarpon, and, but we've all evolved together in a really positive way for this beautiful town that we have. And, um, you know, the mayor and I talked many times um, before I was a commissioner. So just, so just to make it clear, anybody watching, <laughs> that we talked about, you know, our obligation in the town and why we're doing what we're doing. And we obviously have an obligation to our children and our grandchildren, but we also, also have an obligation, and, and the mayor would always tell me, he needed to honor his father and his grandfather. And we need to work, and that's, I think this whole board is, and that's why I'm so proud to be up here with them, is they are steadfast in their, uh, in their zeal to preserve our town. And they have done that. Uh, I think we are f always fighting. So Tarpon is this, has the same, it's going to be different. It's obviously different in 1922 than it, it is in 2023, but we want to preserve that heart that we have. And um, one more thing, I don't think people grow to be, uh, live to be 100 years old without families. And I can, let me speak about my cousin Karen. We should all be so blessed to have a child who would take care of us and be there for us the way that you have been for your mother. That I see them together everywhere. Um, they're like sisters, but you are a big reason she's here with us today, and you know that. So, thank you. Let me uh, ask the commission if you would like to make any comments. Anyone? Commissioner Kudias? Uh, it's just a privilege to be here tonight in front of these three recipients, and they are Tarpon Springs history. They're the ones who decorate our town. It's just uh, happy to see everyone here tonight for it. Thank you. I'm just proud to sit up here with the group that is in front of me. You've seen a lot. Um, I hope you can appreciate that uh, change is on the way, but we will follow in your footsteps. So thank you for being here. And only another 100 years. <laughs> thank you. Um, all I want to do is, you know, we, we're up here all the time. We talk about the beauty of Tarpon Springs, the bayous, the beaches, um, the parks, but we don't often talk a lot about our residents, which is truly the treasure of Tarpon Springs. And if it wasn't you, you know, we wouldn't be up here for that. I mean, you know, Tarpon could very easily be a, a I hate to use the word, a Dunedin or, or Clearwater or something like that, but it wouldn't be Tarpon Springs. But you want it the way it is, and we're gonna, for me, I'm gonna pledge you, I've got two years left, I'm gonna keep it the way it is. So thank you, and congratulations to the families you have treasures in your, within your own family, and, and um, 
and I'm, I'm glad that everyone's here enjoying this this evening. So thank you. I'm going to ask um, if there's any residents that would like to make any comments on the tr three recognitions that we've made tonight. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Taylor, come forward. Katie Taylor, 1991 Douglas Lane. I want to know, uh, let everybody know that I do know the Crawfords, right. and uh, Mr. Crawford been around a long time, and so has his family. I went to school with them, and although I don't know Ms. Hulis personally, I went to school with your grandchildren, so I know you're good people. Thank you all, and God bless you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Um, I've got one more proclamation to make, and then we're going to take a five-minute recess and let everybody that like to leave go ahead and leave at that time. So if we could all just be patient for about five more minutes. Um, Ms. Please come up, Mr. Crawford. My name is Nathaniel Crawford, Jr. I am proud son of Nathaniel Crawford, Sr. And I appreciate you, Mayor, and this committee uh, honoring and recognizing my father as well as uh, Ms. Hulis and Ms. Arianas. Recognizing the pillars of our community it's so special and we appreciate that. I want to say something about my dad because when people ask me who my hero was as I sojourned through college, sports and athletics, I told them my dad is my hero because what he taught me and my siblings about life. My dad went through hell growing up in this country like most people who's this color. But what I learned from my dad and what he taught us as well as my mother, how to love people no matter what color they are or what their race is. Amen. That's what he and my mother taught us. Amen. And because of that, we were able to live a life that resembled not only faith, but love for this country. And I, I appreciate that, and I think that is so important because he could have easily taught all five of us to hate white folk because of all the hell they put us through. But he taught us to love people, Amen. especially people who had character. In my experience in this town, I was able to be blessed by a number of people who weren't all black, who helped me, Nate Crawford to succeed and be what I have become. And it's because of what that man believed and what he taught is why we are where we are right now. And I agree with the mayor about the wonderful things about Tarpon Springs. And a lot of it has to do with these people who were on it today. Amen. And my dad is one of them. So I thank God for you all recognizing them and I am committed to doing my best to follow his example as well as these lovely ladies who planted love and care and concern for every and anybody. Amen. So thank you all for that honor. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Crawford. Mrs. Miles, you Ms. Miles, you stood up. Did you want to say something too? Or are you just trying to get my attention? No, I'll okay. Back. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Crawford. Thank you. Oh, Tom, come on up. Tom Coleano's 1250 South Pinellas Avenue. I just wanted to echo what my brother said about our Thea Lenny. And I remember the day when we were young and we'd go to Joliet 
visit them. And earlier this evening, John Willekes and I made a pact that this is such a nice affair that 20 years from now, we're both going to be here. Thank you. <laughs> I'm the daughter of Lula, who lives a lot you, and I just want to say that um, we're just uh, six generations here, and we all grew up together. Yes. We all took care of each other. Um, just like we say, a village raises everybody's children, and we're blessed that we have that still. We are that Hallmark movie. That's right. So when y'all had the 4th of July thing, everybody should have been out there. So when y'all have, we have city things, we need to support it. So we thank you everybody for being here and our families. My mom is my everything. Uh, my dad died when he was 45. She raised us too. She got a job at the post office and got another job and worked hard all her life. Got cancer, survived that. And um, we're just so glad to have her here 104 years. So. <laughs> Well, you know, Tarpon Springs in 1887, all the way through, at least in the 20s on, has always been one community, to, despite the communities, the cultures, the ethnic, the race or anything. It's always, I grew up, it was always one community. And it's, and, and largely it it's, has stayed that way and we'd like to keep it that way. So, thank you. I have a proclamation. Um, this month is Parks and Recreation Month. So the proclamation is from the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, whereas proclaiming July as Parks and Recreation Month is an opportunity for us, our community, and local leadership to officially acknowledge the importance of our parks and recreation and the benefits provided to the people we serve. And whereas since 1985, People across the United States have celebrated Parks and Recreation Month to promote building strong, vibrant, and resilient communities and to recognize the workers and volunteers that maintain our community parks. And whereas this year's theme, where community grows, celebrates the vital role parks and recreation play in bringing people together, providing essential services, and whereas parks and recreation programs enhance the quality of life for our residents by providing places of enjoyment and allow opportunities for young people to live, grow, and develop, and a place for older citizens to maintain healthy hearts and minds and to easily access the great outdoors. And whereas during Parks and Recreation Month observance, it is important to recognize the contributions of our dedicated employees and volunteers who provide and preserve the quality of our parks and the recreation opportunities offered to our residents and to the many visitors that we serve. Now therefore, I, Costa Vaticotis, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Tarpon Springs, do hereby proclaim July 2023 as Parks and Recreations Month. So. Two gentlemen, James and Jamie. One is from Parks and Parkways. Recreation, Parks. So, there we go. So let me give you that one. And here you go, gentlemen. Would you two like to say something? Yeah. I uh, would just like to say appreciate the uh, support from Mayor, Board of Commission, City Manager, and City Staff here. Uh, working in Tarpon is really a, a team atmosphere and it's really incredible with the special events of all the different departments that come out. Uh, Public Works, their work to keep the parks beautiful. Um, the impacts of parks and recreation on, on physical and mental health, is, it's fantastic and really special to be part of the City of Tarpon here. Thank you. Thank you. James Burke, Park and Parks Way Division. Uh, it, it is an honor to work here in the city. Uh, it's an honor to talk to the residents and to be able to do the work that benefits everyone here, young and old. Thank you. Um, 
parks and parkways are for our residents and to enjoy and, and we try to maintain them the best that we can. Obviously it's an ongoing process and these gentlemen and all the employees and their divisions and departments work hard and we spend as much money as we can given priorities of things to keep our parks and recreation uh, facilities as beautiful as we can. So I very much appreciate their effort. Any commissioners would like to say anything on that? Any residents? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Mr. Jones. Graham Jones, 2056 North Point Alexis Drive, Tarpon Springs. Since it is Parks and Recreation Month, um, perhaps Parks and Rec would like to get together with the Sanitation Department and see if they can do something about Dorset Park. The south um, west corner of that has been um, a parking lot and a, uh, a recycle um, collection place for um, forever, and yet it was originally designated as part of Dorset Park. And it'd be really nice if we could actually get that section of that block back to the local residents to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say we're already working on that. Um, we're working on building a new Cops and Kids building and Public Services building, and we're planning and incorporating all the area around the back part of the park. So we've got big plans we're in the preliminary stages of working on. So look at the future, and, and, and you're going to be seeing something real good in that project there. Good. Thank you. That that was actually uh, discussed last year and the commission agreed to go ahead and, and move forward with that. So it's a plan in, in motion. And I think what we're doing right now is simply waiting to finish that um, uh, conversion from one side of Mears Boulevard to the other and then we'll get to the other side from a design perspective. But thank you for your comment. Um, what I'm gonna do now is take a five minute recess. It's 6.58 and we'll reconvene at 7.03.
Uh, we're going to go to public comments. Is there anyone here for public comments? If you could please come forward, state your name and address. Oh, I'm sorry. Hang on, Mr. Geddes. We have a special presentation. I apologize, Ms. Jennings. Um, pardon me? Hang on a second. Are we all set, ready to go? Okay. Actually, now I'm set, ready to go. <laughs> Sorry. That's my excuse, Ms. Jennings. I couldn't find my glasses. My excuse is I hate. Let me know when you're ready to go. Yeah, I'm a mouse addict. Diane, can yeah. you just, just have to cut that. <coughs> We're all set. Yep. We have a special presentation, our annual report for our Public Arts Committee. Ms. Woods. Good evening, uh, Diane Wood. I am the liaison for the Public um, Art Committee, and uh, they've been very busy this year. And so we're here this evening to um, give you our uh, annual report by our chair, Joan Jennings. I'll turn it over to her. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, commissioners, Residents, my name is Joan Jennings. I'm the chair of the Public Art Committee, and this is our annual report. I hope it's our annual report. You need a six-year-old. I know. Okay. okay, let's start with the budget. Uh, this is for fiscal 23-24. Uh, uh, we always have a budget, a uh, line item in our budget for uh, repairs and maintenance. Uh, the first line uh, looks odd. It's an expense for Amazon, but the illuminated art boxes on the sponge docks needed uh, new batteries. So that's what that expense is for. Uh, the other expense is for St. Kate's, and it's for maintenance of our brass sculptures. Uh, promotional activities, we pay the artists whose work go into the illuminated art boxes, uh, $100 a piece. We had uh, 33 of them, so that's $3,300, and we made a donation to the Tarpon Springs Art Association. Our operating supplies, there are two expenditures for fast signs, those are the signages for the sculptures down on the docks. And the UPS store was the uh, printing of the vinyl panels for the illuminated art boxes. Um, Kyle Pierce, uh, that was the fee for the uh, Sylvester the Cat. Uh, Sydney Prusso was for a mural proposal. And Elindia Elizabeth Indianos for preparing a film about uh, the uh, historic mural. So our total expenditures this year were $13,956.15. Our art balance is uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year 23 was uh, $184,911. Our revenue from development was $8,273. Our expenditures were $13,956.15. So we have a balance as of July 5th of $179,227.85. Our accomplishments for this year was a repair of the Glenna Goodacre Storytime Bench, the installation of Kyle Pierce's Sylvester the Cat Sculpture on the Sponge Docks. We had a contest to name the Mike Elwell Pelican Sculpture. And we had signage for both, both sculptures. Uh, the third round of local artist submissions were placed in illuminated art boxes on the sponge docks. Uh, we now have 20 of them. Uh, we increased it by five. That can accommodate 40 images. And in progress is our Black Heritage Project. The repair of the teak bench for story time was actually uh, done voluntarily by local business owner Eddie Mullally and his friend Louis Gonzalez. 
Um, he made the mistake of posting online that he was refinishing the teak on his boat. So he ended up repairing the teak on the bench. Okay, he did it at no cost. These are our two uh, newer sculptures on the uh, sponge docks. Uh, Sylvester the cat and Pete the pelican. They both have historic and cultural tie-ins to the people in the town. Uh, Sylvester the cat was um, actually a, a real animal that lived on the sponge docks who <coughs> was kind of a local tourist attraction because he would dive into the Antelope River trying to get fish away from the pelicans. <laughs> so, you remember? Somebody remembers Pete? Uh, and a uh, long time Tarpon Springs resident, Joy Sackelson Giorgio, won the Name the Pelican contest with Pete, and it was on, in honor of her late brother, whose photo she's holding. Um, Mayor Vatikiotis and the entire public art committee and, and Diane went down to the uh, docks for a photograph uh, at, at the sculpture. Uh, Joy and her family have lived in Tarpon for many generations. Uh, we continue to make the news with the illuminated art boxes. Uh, this was an article in the Suncoast News. And these are some of the images that we had in the latest round of artworks. Uh, tomorrow at a meeting of the Public Art Committee, we're going to be sending out the call to artists for our fourth round. So it's, it's really doing very well. And, uh, the Black Heritage Project uh, consists of two pieces by artist Stephen Oliver. Uh, this piece is located in the Union Academy neighborhood. It's phase one of the project, and it includes pictures of local black leaders and citizens who contributed to the culture of Tarpon Springs. The sculpture emulates a sponge hooking crawl or corral used by the early Afro-Bahamians. Phase two is an expository arch containing historic photographs and images from the early Afro-Bahamian sponge hookers and divers. QR codes will be added to provide additional information. The piece will be located on the Enclote River close to an historic baptismal site. There will be seating and shade to allow visitors to contemplate the images and text and to enhance the message of the sculpture. Phase three is a wayfinder sign to direct visitors to the contemplative archway on the river. And it will be, in, it's under consideration by the uh, Public Art Committee. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, it has a kind of subtle photograph of an Afro-Bahamian uh, holding a wreath of sponges. Uh, this is our merry little band, myself. Graham Jones and Dawn Arbatello are with us tonight. Uh, we have Eleni Biva Christopoulos, Robert Stackhouse, Nick Toth, and Sonia McGrath. And of course, our liaisons, Diane Wood and Megan McIntyre. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Jennings. <laughs> um, City Manager LaCourse, you want to add anything to this? Or no. Right now? Um, the Public Art Committee is a very active and impassioned <laughs> committee. They're very, very, um, they're artists, and um, I, I, um, I'm an engineer. <laughs> Sometimes artists and engineers don't mix well, so I let the artists do what they need to do because I don't know anything about art, but they do a wonderful job, and they're very um, selective as far as the artwork goes, which I'm always very, very thankful for. I'm very tastefully done. So let me ask commissioners, would, do any of you have any comments that you would like to make? I think, okay. Commissioner Eisner, did you? I just wanted to agree with you. I know nothing on art, so I leave that to the experts. Yeah. And, um, and it is an ongoing process. That's the thing. Every year we get a, uh, an annual report, but it's like everything else. Um, it's not the end of the road. 
there'll be a next year and a next year and a next year. And then we also have to do what we need to do here at the, at, within the commission to be able to complement that. And there's some things that we still need to do in that regard, and we'll talk about that uh, later. Um, let me go to public comments. Uh, does anybody have any public comments concerning the Public Art uh, Committee's annual report? Okay. Um, Mr. Mr. Atkins. I can ask a question real quick. Uh, Zeb Atkinson, 621 East Orange Street. Um, can you tell me how Sylvester the Cat makes it on a sponge dock, but the African-American sculpture doesn't? Uh, I, I the just, location for Sylvester the Cat was where the cat was. Were the black sponges not working on the sponge dock? Yeah, but they're being on the, they're, they have, that piece has a location on the river. And if, if you'd like more information, I defer to the city manager. Well, yeah, we tried that last, last time. Well, the thing is, <laughs> just, it's a. Joan, Joan, just. Okay. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Atkins. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And we do not have anyone in attendance this time. Okay. Ms. Jennings, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Ms. You're Woods, welcome. thank, thank you, you all. Okay. Thank you. Now we'll go to public comments. Um, are there any any public comments here this evening? Mr. Geddes. Thank you, Mayor. David Ballard Geddes Jr. I live at 802 Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. 14 years ago, Pinellas County waylaid the residents into filling out a reclaimed water variance application. As applied, the variance is a eminent domain of both our personal and real property as recognized in statute 15303 section five. It allows third parties to levy into the equity of our homes for what's known as a transfer of development rights. The Pinellas County reclaimed water variance application further states that I, the applicant, literally owe my health my safety and my religious convictions. The reclaim water variance is in total disrespect, violating the First Amendment of the US Constitution, violating Article I, Section 3 of the Florida Constitution, violating Pinellas County Home Rule Charter, Section 2.02E. The variance implicates both the county and its interlocal private public partnerships in its establishing of a state of apartheid against Christianity using water as its weapon of choice. As applied to the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, the variance can be seen as the taking of liberty, property, and life blasphemous to my religion vanquishing Christianity as based on Federalist Paper Number 2 and 52 in a constituted act of attrition. Moving Pinellas forward in an act of demagoguery and sacrilege, do I think reclaimed water is going to be used as a chemical and biological weapon as a makeshift gas chamber used to used against us Christians seen as a clearinghouse mechanism as recognized in statute 163.3167 section 11 stemming from 2007 as I live in what's known as a ready to serve zone. In hindsight, does the Declaration of Independence state that Christianity is on a long train of perfidy and works of death? desolating, destroying Christianity, establishing despots and tyrants thereof, declaring that they are to be protected by mock trial from any murders that they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, as declared, further declaring themselves that they are free to levy war, deaf to the voice of justice, declaring that they are here to eat us out of our subsistence as undistinguished savages, insurrectionists, giving rise to unwarranted water jurisdictions under the 14th Amendment, here to plunder, ravage, and destroy, declaring that mankind is more disposed to suffer 
while evils are sufferable in a constitutional act of hypocrisy. And I have a grievance, and I've been doing this for 14 years. I'm getting tired, and I would like to be heard. Apparently, Judge Keith Myers is deaf. Thank you. Um, are there any other public comments? Good afternoon, Mayor. Good city commissioners. With all due respect, I come with, to speak to you in humble with humility on my heart. It's not out of any kind of negativity here. Uh, last week, the last time I came to this meeting, I was a bit taken back by Mr. LaCour's comments to me um, on my, my version of what I said about the uh, Bahamian Sponger project down in Greektown. After I spoke to the, about this Bahamian Sponger art project history, not being told as history is being told, which were the first sponges worked on the docks at the sponge docks. They didn't work at the marina. They worked at the, the docks. Mr. LaCouris, you stated, I've been offended by everything Ms. Taylor said. Her, her misrepresentation of the project is not correct and that she had called, that you had called people in the community to tell them that what Ms. Taylor said was not, be, was not correct. My question to you, Mr. LaCouris, is what was it I supposedly said about the project that was misrepresentation of the city? The minutes I referred to were taken directly from the Arts Council minutes dated January 2020 to 2023. These minutes also showed that they were Black Heritage Project Committee that was established, which Ms. <coughs> Ms. Jones just, just spoke of, that wrote, uh, that worked on this project. That committee, along with the artists, did research and gathered historical information for the exhibit. They recommended that the exhibit be put placed in front of the sponge exchange, in front of the planners, in front of the sponge exchange. The questions were that it was foot traffic in front of the sponge exchange, <coughs> which rails could have been put up, just like it was down by the restaurants further west. Rails could have been put up right there in front of that sponge exchange that people wouldn't have stepped in front of traffic in front of that exhibit. Mr. LaCourse, I would like to ask you, what research did you do on this location? Did you meet with the, with the director of the marina to ask of his input? Was any safety concerns considered? What wasn't the black, what was it, why wasn't the Black History Project uh, location uh, accepted? They were telling the history correctly. Mr. LaCourse, in your own words, you said, it's, my ha it's in my hands, it, it's been voted on, and it's been done. I do not agree with the artist's contract being used as an excuse to close the matter. There should have been cl clauses in the contract to cover, the situa to cover situations. The, the city spent close to five years on the Nyad sculpture, which, was, which are fictional characters, have no historical value to the community, yet it's on a prime location at the end of the sponge docks. The Bahamian Sponger Project took less than three years, which five months of, of it was never discussed in the Arts Council meeting, in the minutes that I read. What, what was it discussed in the, in the commissioner's meeting with y'all during those times that it weren't discussed in the Art Council? Mr. LaCourris, please remember, I pay taxes and those taxes pay your salary. I would not expect the city official to make such deflammatory statements by saying you actually made phone calls to people stating I misrepresented the, sit, the city of Tarpon Springs. After 45 years of tenure with the city, of all the people, you should know better. I found your comments to be pompous and arrogant. As a citizen, I have the right to voice my opinion. And in this case, I feel like you were wrong. I would, it, it is now seems that all of, this, all, of the, all of this is resting on your shoulders, Mr. LaCourse because you said you personally selected the location. I would like them, the mayor and all the commissioners to know I have not said anything to anybody in the community that I have not said in front of all of you sitting here. I do not have, I do not have a clue of what Mr. LaCourse has been told about who, he to, who, who told him what. I would have rather he spoken directly to me rather than get up on public forum and, and call my name to say of hearsay. At his level of management, I do not think it was in his best interest to openly state he made phone calls to people in the community to correct statements he said I made, which I still don't have a clue what those statements were. M making such calls could be, could be defamation to my character. Mr. LaCourse's vision is five years away. 
it is not working for our community today. Again, I would like to ask the city to revisit the contract, pay the artist to relocate the exhibit. History should be told correctly that these sponges deserve the respect to be represented on the sponge exchange way they actually work. They did not work behind the marina in a back parking lot. I noticed that up here you had a, the art, the art committee mm -hmm. showed y'all a picture of where, that, where the mm -hmm. exhibit was gonna go. I have pictures too, because when you look at a TV commercial, you look at- Ms. Uh, Taylor, we- When you look at a TV commercial, you see one thing, you, but on the real thing, I'm gonna give y'all this and I'll oh, one. Okay. Ma'am. Hand it to me. You want to say anything? I, 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 Thank you. I'm pretty sure if the case is closed, y'all no, made no, y'all no, demand no, up on what y'all going to do, but I just want you to hear that. Push me, but maybe you, you know, iron out any differences or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Ms. Taylor, where are you? Um, I, I'm going to ask the city. I was just asking him whether you wanted to say anything or not, and and I think that the best thing would be for you. And I know you. I don't think you've talked to him since the last time. He made those comments. I think is what is um, what you're inferring, and I would like for you to, for you two to get together, and kind of pick it up from there, if that's okay. Rather than trying to do Mr. some discussion Kirk this made evening. Quite clear, he has made up his mind. The vote stopped with him. You put it in his hands. He's made a decision. It to is put in that his hands. Uh, that's at the back of that visitors bureau, yeah. visitor center. No, he, what which he's is saying not appropriate. Is, what, what he's saying is correct. Is it's in his hands, but it sounds like. There's some more things that need to be talked out. So thank yeah. you, Ms. Taylor. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Sitting God bless you. Just one thing, because I'm not going to debate it here. Everybody, and there's some people in here who've known me a long time. I had to make the calls because I saw things on Facebook, and it was the depiction of the city, those hardworking volunteers from the art <coughs> committee who spent two years on this, this, this commission who made the decision location, and a lot of effort by me and my staff to find the right place, the right place to give dignity to this project. And there's a lot of reasons why the location chosen was chosen because it was best to give the dignity and for the future what can do with this project and stuff they were after. And we all spent a lot of time in two and a half years doing this. And a lot of these people in this, in this audience that know me, knowing the 45 years I've been here, I haven't lied to them, I haven't misled them, or I haven't done anything. And I think Ms. Taylor should talk to some of those people um, that I had to dispel this depiction of we were burying a project of the Bohemian Divers, we were burying it at a, the worst place in the sponge that could be. And that's the farthest thing for the truth. And I can't apologize because I stand by that because I'm the one who worked hard, <coughs> was out there in the hot sun looking for the right place where the most people could see it, where you could put some places for people to sit and reflect on the history and stuff. And I believe me, this is one thing I promised this community and I haven't broken my promises over my 45 years. When this thing is done, come down and see it, and then you can tell me if I'm right or Ms. Taylor's right. I'm, I'm free for any of you to call me and give you the whole two and a half year story of how this came out. I'd be glad to talk to you individually about that, like I've done with many in the community who's known me. I've, they've grown up with them as kids in my Cops and Kids program, and uh, the depiction that we we're burying this thing because of what the project is, is the farthest thing from the truth. So that, that's all I want to say on it, Mayor. Okay. Let me, um let me interject here. It's 7.30, Mr. Rockland, if you could be a little patient. We've got to shift over to our ordinances and resolutions, and this should be, uh, it should go fairly quick, and, um, and we'll be right back and finish up with public comments with anybody who wants to say anything. That's nothing, that's not on the agenda. So uh, item 14, Mr. Salzman, if you could read ordinance 2023-07 by title, please. Ordinance 2023-07, an ordinance of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, submitting to the electors of the City of Tarpon Springs a referendum question and ballot title for the purchase of the Roosevelt Boulevard properties from Santorini Developers, LLC, for preservation, parkland, event space, parking, and civic use, and providing for an effective date of the ordinance. That's Ordinance 2023-07, read by title only. Second reading will be on August 8th, 2023, and will be published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only. Okay, uh, City Manager, of course, would you like to give us some background on this? Yes, this is, this is the property, make sure the four, 
This is uh, the property that's known by many as the former hotel property on the docks. Um, this is something that we negotiated a deal for. Obviously, because of the price, it has to go to a referendum, and it's the people who's going to make the final decision on this project. So one of the requirements is two readings of an ordinance. Um, when it comes to the second reading, there'll be the resolution with the ballot language um, about the purchase of this, of this piece of property, and then it ultimately goes on goes in the hands of the residents at the November election to decide if we're to purchase this property or not. So this is the, this is the first step, the reading of the ordinance. Again, there'll be a second reading and then also a resolution with the ballot language for what the people have to decide. Okay. Uh, are there any public comments on this ordinance? Anita Prost, 901 Bayshore Drive. Two questions. What is the amount you're looking at to purchase this property? I'm sorry, didn't understand. You're right. 1.8 million. That's what I thought. And it's going to cost anywhere from 38 to 40,000 to have the uh, uh, referendum election because we can't piggyback on anybody, any other election. Is that the cost? Mm -hmm. Could you speak into the microphone more, Anita, please? What is the cost of having this referendum question brought forth to the citizens? Ms. Jacobs, do you have any information? Um, it is a standalone election. Um, it, would, it could run anywhere from thirty-eight dollars to $40,000. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And we do not have anyone in attendance at this time. Okay. Pub, uh, commission comments, anything? Um, this has been worked out. No comments? Okay. Uh, if there is no further comments, roll call, please. D um, uh, you know, did you want to say something? No, you need a motion. Yeah, go ahead and make a motion in a second. Thank um, you for reminding me of that. Motion to approve ordinance 2023-07. Second. No further comments. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kulianis? Yes. Commissioner Puyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, item 15, resolution 2023-22. Um, Mr. Salzman, if you could read the resolution by title, please. Resolution 2023-22, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, authorizing the adoption of the City of Tarpon Springs Sustainability Plan and providing for an effective date hereof. Okay. City Manager Lickworth. Yeah, as it, we had a very good presentation on it the other night. Here's the formalization, so I'll bring, I'll bring um, Paul Smith up, and you want to bring Robin up too? Good evening, Paul Smith, Public Service Director, and uh, also joining me at the podium will be Sustainability Coordinator Robin Reeves. Um, this item was uh, requesting the adoption of the city's first sustainability plan, and this is a follow-up to uh, a presentation at the last meeting, and um, we received feedback and incorporated it into the final document, and uh, we look forward to implementation. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, Hang on a second. Um, are there any public comments on this item? Peter Lacks, 514 Ashland Avenue. Um, I would recommend everybody take a look at this plan uh, it encompasses a lot more than what you might think about right off the bat when you hear sustainability I know uh, we think of an environment and sea level rise and climate change and not having because it's in the backup and your plan there so I was hoping you'd give a little presentation to show the whole range of what this plan looks to do. Uh, but 
my purpose here is not only to recommend that you pass it, which I'm sure you are going to, but to thank this board, uh, previous boards that initiated uh, action by the request of citizens to do this. Uh, being in a bayou, river, gulf area with so much water. In fact, we were at the uh, rec center last night and there's a picture that shows all the different sea level rises we're gonna see and from tidal flooding and storm flooding and we're the most vulnerable. But the point I wanted to make is that there's other things that talks about the economic effects the social effects, creating what we call uh, tree islands to help people with heat areas and a, a whole variety of things. Uh, so I would recommend if you have a time moment, uh, it's on the Connect Tarpon Spring site, also the plan, so maybe y'all can address to that when I'm done. But I wanna thank Dory Larson, uh, Robin Sanger, Ms. Gallagher, Dr. Robinson, all the other people on the committee from the beginning who helped push this vision forward. And the hard work and the efforts they did to coordinate everything, to do this in a professional manner. And I just want to say thank you. We're on the right track. You had parks and recreation earlier. And as your gentleman said, nature and parks is a respite for all, and we need to make all of our parks and all our areas available. And I didn't want to get up and have to keep speaking, but with regards to parks, I've mentioned before the sports complex on the landfill. We've talked about it before, pool. We need a pool. So I just want to throw that in as incorporation, but thank you. Paul, he's been there from the beginning. Robin joined us. God bless you, Dory. Thank you. Is there any other public comments? Mrs. Larson is coming to the, um, to the podium and I'd like to recognize her as the original chairperson for the Sustainability Committee and, and thank you for being here this evening. Thanks. Um, Dory Larson, 1846 Lexington Place um, in Tarpon. And I just want to express my gratitude to this commission, to the commissions before um, city manager for hearing us as a community say that we need this and this is a vital part of making sure that that our city is sustainable for the future. I mean, the reason I started thinking about it is because I want my boys to be able to live here and I want my grandkids to be able to live here and I want them to be able to live here in an even more vital capacity than we have now. And not just for my kids, but for our whole community to be able to live their best lives, to work here and to enjoy all of the beautiful things that we have in our community and our town. And to be th thinking about that into the future and what we need to do to, make, to ensure that. So I'm um, super thankful to, to Paul Smith and to Robin for um, being our staff uh, cheerleaders and getting this off the ground. It's been like a labor of love for several years. So thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And we do not have anyone in attendance at this time. Okay. Um, let me just, uh, first of all, um, Ms. Reeves, thank you very much uh, for all your hard work, and I understand you're going to be moving on to greener pastures soon. And um, I'd like to uh, thank you for leaving us at a good place uh, on this, and that um, you did a wonderful job to get it, to get us to where we are. Um, the other part I want to say is I wish somewhere along the line, and maybe I could encourage Mrs. Larson in her free time to kind of put together the saga of how we started, not we, I, um, how the turn, turn the tide for Tarpon, um, a grassroots organization started with the environmental issues in Tarpon Springs and then that kind of evolved into um, bringing people into the city commission meeting insisting that we uh, create a sustainability committee and from there uh, insisting that we have a sustainability coordinator 
and from there we have a sustainability action plan. So that's a pretty good story um, and the way things should work in a small community and it did work that way. Um, the turn, the tide for Tarpon was um, largely associated with environmental issues and um, this sustainability action plan is truly for the city to remain sustainable. It's not just the environment, but it's the economic and also the so social variables that need to be taken into account, which is what this plan does. And, and, and I think that's extremely important and complements <coughs> the other strategic and comprehensive plan that we have as well. So I'm hoping at some point in the future we'll all see them working together, integrating and working as one. So um, we're done with the public comments. I'm done with my comments. Um, and Mr. Smith, I know you before Robin was there <laughs> kind of uh, acting on the city manager's behalf and, and I very much appreciate that effort as well. I know you're, you're inclined towards the environment and uh, that's good, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Commissioner Comments. Uh, Commissioner Kulianis, you got your light on. Yep. By the way, we've got this, these things here that you push a light and it turns the light on here to let me know somebody wants to talk so I'm not being a wise guy towards Mr. Kulianis. <laughs> no, it's not. And, and furthermore, I just, I remember when I used to uh, sit out there in the public and I would see a commissioner scrolling through a computer and I thought they were, you know, playing solitaire or games. Uh, uh, this is where we see the same thing that's up there. We see it here on our screen. So that's just, just letting you know that we're, pay we are paying attention. Um, Robin, you, you broke my heart. Uh, you're, you did such an amazing job on this, and, and Paul, I mean, um, but I know you're going to do wonderful things where, in Orlando and wherever you go in your life because uh, you're a, a special person. So I just want to thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Eisner. Well, I don't know about you, but I was playing a video game here. Um, <laughs> no, all joking aside. <laughs> Um, you know, what I wanted to say about this, this was a, a change in Tarpon Springs direction that was probably one of the hardest changes to make. Um, change like this is very, very difficult. Dory did a great job. I spoke to you a number of times. Um, we didn't always agree, but you, your strong fest and your determination Along with Robin, you've done an amazing job. We're going to be really sorry to see you, you know, go. Um, but you did a very professional job. Um, I've seen and heard only complimentary uh, comments about it. We've spoken about it with you, Paul, in the office. And if we get 80% of this accomplished, I will be thrilled. Um, if you don't take charge of something, then you take charge of nothing. So uh, I'm, I'm just glad that you put this together for us. Um, do monitor us to make sure we're staying on a beaten path. You know, check in with us. Um, I hope that we can get somebody at least even equal to your replacement value. You've been an amazing value. And to all of the original committee people, you guys all have done a great job. Um, it's not easy to set up something like this from with having no background. I know you picked and choose from other towns, but it, you know, we're a unique town. And uh, I, when, as I look over this, this is Tarpon Springs. And I wanna thank you all. Paul, you know me, I always thank you. you. You're just a delight to deal with. And I appreciate all that you do. So thank you everybody that was involved in this. Vice Mayor Lund. Yeah. I also uh, wanna, offer my heartiest thanks to the previous committee members, the current committee members, and especially to uh, Robin to putting it all together. It has been a haul. It was very difficult, required a lot of back and forth. Um, we came up with a sustainability plan that is so well thought out you would have thought that it came from a major city rather than from a, a small community like Tarpon Springs. It is completely detailed. It takes into account 
almost every variable that you could as far as sustainability. And I happen to have seen a lot of uh, program management stuff during, during my life. And it is one of the best put together that I have ever seen. Um, Robin, as the saying goes, um, you're the cook of all this. I think you deserve a Michelin star. We're going to miss you very, very much. And thank you. And thank you very much for all your hard work. Commissioner Kulias. <clears throat> yes, I just thought, uh, uh, Robin, thank you for all the hard work you've done and um, actually leaving after putting this hard implementation together and putting this hard plan. That, that was one of the uh, greatest uh, accomplishments that we as a board can, can thank staff for putting together and uh, just everyone who's made it happen to get to the point we're at today. The residents who en ended up becoming committee members who, you know, who we're persistent to get to where we're at, but uh, now after this adoption comes the implementation. So uh, it, it's got to be, you know, the committee's got to stay on top of the board, uh, you know, back and forth and, and working with a new sustainability coordinator who's going to come in and, and help implement this all. So uh, we're just getting started with all this and uh, it's important that future boards um, as well as committees hold each other accountable to make sure that we can get this all uh, in the direction where we have planned out. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, if there's uh, Mr. Smith, anything else? I want to give Robin an opportunity to say anything to the group or? Um, it is definitely bittersweet to leave. It's been so wonderful working here uh, with you all. And I'm so thrilled that I got to see the sustainability plan through to completion. Would not have been able to do it without our fantastic staff team, our, of course, sustainability committee who has been working on this long before I was on board and will continue working on it uh, for years to come. So I'm very happy to have been a part of sustainability and getting the sustainability program started here for the city of Tarpon Springs, but I know that you all are going to continue to do fantastic things, and especially now with the sustainability plan. Can't wait to check in and see how you all are doing. Thank you, So Ms. thank Reeves. you so much, and also for the kind words. Really and thank, appreciate and it. thank you. Thank you. You're always welcome back, you know. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Mayor, thank you, and I just wanted to add, since we were talking about um, Robin's departure, I wanted to assure you all that uh, we understand the importance of the momentum that we've accomplished with the Sustainability Committee, the community, the commission, staff, and in fact, Robin's already helping me working on recruiting. We've got the full support of the city manager to get this position filled with a highly qualified person. I really believe this is a personality type of position. It needs yeah. to be somebody that gets along with all kinds of people and even willing to um, endure a little bit of frustration or slow progress. I mean, it just happens in any organization when you're making changes, which is what this is. So um, we understand, we appreciate your comments and uh, look forward to continuing to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, if there's no other commission comments, we have a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Okay, uh, any other comments, roll call. Commissioner Kulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lutt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay, we're going to return to public comments. Mr. Rockland or whoever else would like to make public comments? Thank you, Mayor, and uh, good evening to the Mayor, the Board members, and senior staff, Robert Rockline, 755 North Lake Boulevard here in Tarpon. Uh, I'd like to stay on the, the Parks and Rec uh, theme, if we could. It was nice to honor uh, the staff and the, uh, the committee members who are involved with that. It's an important facet to our life here. Uh, I think Florida, as well as Tarpon, is very much an outdoor activity community, and uh, I certainly commend their, uh, their dedication to that. I started going to some of the Parks and Rec Committee meetings uh, a few months back, and uh, it was basically on behalf of both my interest and a lot of neighbors' interest in things like pickleball, abachi, and, and such that we don't currently have here now. 
uh, I was especially interested in pickleball because last time I played tennis, I got hit by a car. So that was many moons ago, but I haven't played tennis since, so I was looking to downscale a little. Uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, interesting both to see the interaction and the dynamics with the committee. And it was the last meeting, uh, meeting the other day that I went to that caused me to come up and speak. And I'm certainly not speaking on behalf of any of the committee members, but they, they seem to be a bit frustrated and confused and, and a bit dejected. Uh, and they were actually hoping, hoping a commissioner or two would attend their meeting. I don't know if a formal invite was sent or anything. Uh, mostly to explain the current status of the pickleball proposal and why, of all, why all their time and hard work was now in limbo. Uh, they plan to compose a committee you know, uh, member memo to the board of commissioners in regards for consideration when they meet again next month. So I'm sure that's down the road. Uh, but they worked very closely with the DPW staff, assessing numerous locations, narrowing it down to, I think, four sites that were considered viable for either refreshment of existing flat work or in developing new facilities uh, with minimal, if any, impact, uh, probably having uh, complete stormwater retention uh, and continue to provide an open air and open space type atmosphere and attraction. We're really just changing just a passive use to an active use. Uh, for the recreation of our residents. Several meetings ago, they were in, with the board here, uh, there was no approval granted for a construction contract, and to my knowledge, no public discussion since. I remember the proposal to bring pickleball to our community being pre-approved uh, with dedicated funding allotted to that, so it, it would seem to be a, an easy street. Uh, I'm sure we're all aware of the ever-rising construction costs and materials. Uh, the phrase, time is money, probably could not be more true. Uh, at this time in regards. So now I believe they have both north and south locations that are uh, that were selected in our city that are shovel ready and uh, one, you know, uh, located in the existing fitness park and Dorset Park with minimal work. I think Dorset Park just needs some fence alteration and, and maybe some restriping and the fitness park, I guess, laying a, a new uh, new slab there for this. Uh, and, of course, there's, there was talk of potential east and west locations uh, that were available consideration at the sports complex in Riverside Park. And that would give the city like a four-point compass for, you know, the residents to easily uh, make available their attendance and, uh, and participation. So I know many Tarponites, including a good amount of my neighbors, regularly travel to Newport Ritchie, to Oldsmar, to Palm Harbor, to play pickleball, and I'm sure while they're there, some of them grab a beer or grab a bite or you know, stop and shop for something else. And that money could certainly be better off spent here in Tarpon. Uh, there's also some chatter about maybe private developers interested in converting some Tarpon property, properties into private club courts. Uh, and that could take away from the possibility of any future sponsorship uh, that might give us you know, a little bit of uh, aid in the maintenance and upkeep. It would be nice to garner that before the, the private people could. So I think the question we need to ask ourselves is, do we need, need to make this cost more and do we need to make it take longer than, than it should? Uh, it just seems to be such a low-hanging fruit that it would be a shame to let it die on the vine. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rockler. Are there any other public comments? Peter Lax, 514 Ashland Avenue. Uh, I was going to read Psalm 100, but after listening tonight, I found this one I think is kind of nice. Psalm 133. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious, precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, that even life forevermore. So I say that in how we see our community it's, it's really a blue zone. I don't know if y'all have heard about these places. Japan, there's the, some of the islands in Greece and other areas, blue zones, where people live longer lives because of the community that's there to support them. 
So that was my thoughts coming in after experiencing that ceremony. But now let's get to some business stuff here. Again, I'm gonna speak about the availability of the resources we have on hand to reach out to our residents in a more effective manner. You can ask Chief Young what to do, but our radio, 1610, it plays the same over and over. It does, I did update the uh, website address about jobs, fire protection or hurricane preparedness and stuff, but that's an avenue to reach out to our residents. One, we need to expand the range. Expand the range. Secondly, use it as a mechanism to broadcast meetings. I leave here, driving home, I'd still like to be able to hear what's going on in the meeting. Pull up 1610, I can get maybe about a mile down the road and then it starts fading out media access. People still listen to the radio, and when the power goes out and you got a battery radio, we know the importance of it. But all we have to do, and Chief Young may know how to handle it, or somewhere else, you go to the FCC, you apply for an expanded license, you say it's for public service, public awareness, community involvement, and then you can also start after a while, and I know the guys upstairs, they hated me for putting forth about all the meetings being on TV, but you can have call-in programs during the afternoons, you can have speak to your manager, speak to a commissioner, there's things like that. So, on that venue, your TV station. I was watching today, Board of Adjustment meeting, 115, it cut off before they made the motion and the vote, and it went to a segment on a documentary about columnists. I love columnists, I went there, but, I wanted to find out how the vote went. And then that was on for about a half hour, then the public art committee meeting came on. So what my thought was, simple, put a banner at the bottom, these are the programs coming up, the programs that will be on later, and also, again, there's informational ways to use your media to expand what you're trying to present to the public. You're gonna have a rev referendum and you're gonna to wanna to have ways to communicate that. Wouldn't it be great to have an hour show talking about the pros and cons of purchasing the property or another hour show for something or other. But the point I'm trying to say is we have these resources and we just need to find ways to fully utilize them. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And we do not have anyone in attendance at this time. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end our public comments and we're gonna go to our consent agenda. And um, as I've done, I'm gonna ask if any commissioners have any comments, um, if we could wait to make those during the vote of, of all the, uh, a consent agenda. If you've got questions, uh, let's pull the item that you've got questions on now. So are there any items that um, any commissioner would like to pull right now? Okay, um, so let me read the consent agenda. We've got um, item one, attorney's fees, person, Cohen, Mooney, Fernandez, and Jackson, PA invoices 3763 and 3812. Uh, item two, approve change order number one to increase file 220125, supply, deliver, and install above ground fuel tank storage tanks. Item three, award file number 230159, sod installation at soccer field. Item four, award file number 230191, park and playground equipment. Item five, award file number 2301. 07 Glock firearms and accessories and item six authorize execution of first amendment to library interlocal agreement. Um, are there any public comments on any of these items? Item two, please, if you'll pull up your backup. 
Petrol X514 Ashland Avenue. This is with regards to the above ground fuel tanks. Uh, I do want to point out that uh, in the backup there was memos from July 19, 2022 and August 9th of 2022 in which I don't recall which meeting it was I was at that I spoke about this issue but I did have concerns about the diesel link and I had spoken about this issue before. Now we're wanting to increase the file from 205,839 to 239,000 plus and if you read the first memo, purpose is to uh, the change order to provide additional services needed to complete the installation of the fuel surge storage tanks. Well, but look at the memo before that. <sighs> the purpose of this change order is to provide the cha charges accrued due to moving the tanks to a more suitable location where the tanks could be habitable habitable with the city's current reclaimed water storage tanks as requested by treatment plan management. The change order prices to cover additional engineering, concrete cutting, trenching, double wall pipe, pea gravel, backfill labor, concrete, concrete labor, plans redrawn three times, contra restaking tank location, cut and remove additional concert slab, electrical and travel time. I guess my question to the board at this time is, why wasn't that considered in the first shot in the design and looking at, it says here, as requested by treatment plant management. Were they not consulted originally in the beginning? So I, I don't know, I just had questions as to why it maybe wasn't done properly and I still have concerns about the leakage that may be going on from the diesel tanks that are there not far from the Ancloat River. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to have anyone address that, or is there anybody here that can address that? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Delacus. Um, are there any other comments on any of these ten items? Good evening, everyone. Juliana J. Four, thirteen East Oakwood Street, Topham Springs. And thank you for someone getting me back back to me for my last week comments about the water in the street. We're working on it. My comment is item three, um, four, pox and playground equipment. Um, and my topic is at, I'm going back to Dorset Park. That slide there, my oldest daughter's 35. I'm going to be 70 in January. That's how old that slide is. So I hope that you all are looking at refurbishing some of that equipment out there. Also with the trees and things that's there to do something where at least some light comes in. Um, so that's my comment on that part. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Is there anything on that? Go ahead, City Manager Record. Yeah, I just want to say that a couple meetings ago, maybe last meeting, the meeting before, the first phase of that and some new playground equipment was approved by the commission. There's other there's other steps that are going to be there, but but we've already approved the last couple meetings, um, some new equipment to go out there. And I know that slide very well. And uh, we're going to be talking about some more approved. But the first step of new equipment has already been approved, funded, and you'll be seeing soon. And then we'll be looking at some other areas of the park and some improvements we're looking at too right, so because that slide is very dangerous yeah. the height of it yeah so it's for our young children you're, you're going to see some things very soon because it's already been approved by the board and ordered and ready to be installed when it comes in and why was one more question why was the um sale took down at the um, sunset beach on the, over the playground the sale structure at, at for sunset shade. beach for shade um Tom, you, I, I'm trying to remember the different things that <laughs> there's a couple different things like that. There were some families out there last Wednesday and they took their children from the playground because the, the things was hot. Uh, the torn uh, cover was getting repaired. It's just a repair. Uh, okay. Repair, that's all it is. Yes. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Are there any other uh, public comments on any of the 10 items? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And we do not have anyone in attendance at this time. Uh, Commissioner, any comments from any of the commissioners? Yeah, yes, I'm just happy to see on uh, 
Consent agenda item three, the sod installation of the soccer field number four. It's gonna give another uh, field to the area, to Discovery Park, which is uh, good in helping all the different activities that happen over there, so thank you. Yeah. Um, if there's no further comments, may I have a motion uh, to approve items one through, I'm sorry, I said 10, I items one through six. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay, let's go to the special consent agenda. And this is um, award bid number 230152. It's the reconstruction of the intersection at South Spring Boulevard and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. Uh, city manager, of course. Yes, this is something we've all been waiting for because of the timing issue. So I'm going to have Bob Robertson start out. Um, Janina is going to also be available if there's some questions about the bids and the bid process. So I'll start off with Bob um, about this project, a brief overview of what it's done, and finally going to bid and getting this started. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good evening, Mayor Commissioners. I'm Bob Robertson, Project Administration Department Director. For this item, we're requesting the board's approval to award a contract to AJ General Construction Services for the MLK Junior, excuse me, MLK Junior Dock Drive, South Spring Boulevard intersection improvements project. As a reminder, this project will address flooding and safety at this intersection by raising the elevation of the road. Um, it's also going to add new stormwater drainage infrastructure and check valves, and adjust the intersection geometry to make it a smoother and safer four-way stop. The amount of the contract is $1,071,600, the bulk of which is funded by a grant from the state of Florida and federal ARPA grant funds. This is a contractor that we've not worked with yet. So we did check references and we did ev and everything appears to check out. We noted they are a pre-qualified FDOT contractor for drainage, grading, and sidewalks. We also conducted a post-bid meeting with the procurement and our engineer of record and the contractor to confirm their knowledge and commitment uh, matches the um, uh, the goals of this project. So, Mayor, that's all my for my preamble. Back to you. Okay. Uh, let me go to public comments. Are there any public comments on this item? Ms. Coburn. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, my concern uh, is only the timing of this, uh, particularly hurricane season. We tear up that road. Uh, is it going to be torn up when, if there's a hurricane, say in October, and people are having to leave, and you know it's it's a mess out there? Um, how long? When can we start? How long is it going to take? And uh, what accommodations going to be made for traffic and the heavy equipment that's going to be right there? Where are you going to place it? All that kind of stuff. Those are my questions. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Mr. Robertson, do you want to address that? Sure. Um, sum summarizing, the project won't start till after August anyway. We need to finish the MLK pipeline project before we do any more work okay. on MLK. Okay. So okay. we wouldn't even start, um, we, we wouldn't even see the first mobilization till September. Okay. Um, so I feel like by the time they get fully mobilized, they're probably not going to have too much risk of hurricane. I understand that's the he okay. height of hurricane season, but um, we will require them to make accommodations for storm prep. We do that with all our contractors if there's an impending storm. Um, schedule is, is set at um, six months for substantial completion. Um, they are required to have their detour set up and roads closed no longer than 60 days. Uh, and that is in the contract that way. Okay. Did that answer the question, or is there something else I could address? Uh, any other questions? The only thing, the check valves, can you explain that a little bit? Uh, sure. Where they're going to be and how that's going to affect rain, rain accumulation and, I mean, obviously flooding you, you know. <laughs> sure. So for this intersection, there are two stormwater outfalls. And uh, the way it works now is uh, when the tide rises, water can back right up into the, through the storm drains and it floods the road. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is two things. We're raising the road so that if, if there were to be overtopping, um, it would be at a higher elevation and the, and the intersection wouldn't flood as frequently. And secondly, those pipes that discharge into the, the bayou now have check valves. What that means is that water can only flow one direction, it can flow out. It cannot flow back in through those pipes. Okay, that's good. That was my concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I think, Ms. Coburn, I, I appreciate all your questions, but uh, honestly, we just, you know, we need to get it done. But 
I, I want to say it's one of these that um, um, I'm still, I, I don't want to exude confidence because I, I'm going to be holding my breath. I'd, I'll be happy the day this job is completed and it's working properly. The staff knows how I feel about it. And, and uh, but thank you for your, your questions. Yeah. Appreciate it being done. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> um, are there any other public comments on this item? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And we do not have anyone in attendance at this time. Okay, uh, let me just start this one. Um, I, first of all, I, I want to thank you all for bearing up, bearing with me as far as being patient with all of my questions and even to um, fleshing out additional um, information concerning the contractor. I, I, at this point, I can, I, I can assure, I can actually state publicly that if something goes wrong with this project, it isn't because we didn't do our due diligence uh, concerning the contractor. So I'm, I'm very satisfied with that. And um, I, I do know that the project, I think, was, um, I, th I thought maybe it was 210 days, and, and now it's 180 days or six months. And, and we're going to get started a little later than sooner, I would, is basically what we're saying, right? because we need to finish up some work at Mears? That, yes, sir. Okay. Um, I, I think the timing is important. Um, I know in the communications that I saw between Ms. Lewis and the contractor, there's certain things that he can do, for example, address the drainage issues first and leave the road intact. I think that would be consistent with what Ms. Coburn uh, was addressing. So um, I'd like to, for us to make sure that we, we are his resource, the contractor's resource, so he knows that we can basically give him a sense uh, of our area, what he's gonna have to deal with. Also, I know Mr. Function has a schedule of, of days that could be potential flood days for that area. I'd like for us to make sure we share that information with him so that he knows when to expect that that intersection may be flooding. If it's flooding, he's not gonna be able to work there. So um, it, there's a couple of things that I think there's going to have to be coordination. I think he's going to, from what I can see, he's a good contractor, but also we need to supplement him with local knowledge to make sure his job is done and, and minimizes any problems that we have. So that's all I want to say about it. Um, let me go to uh, uh, Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. So I, I understand how the check valve is going to work when it's high tide. How is it going to work when we have the heavy downpours? Well, they, like I said, they let water flow in one direction. So you, in, a, in any other situation, with or without the check valves, if you have a high tide and you have a rain event, you're going to have flooding. That Unless you have major pump stations, that's unavoidable. But if you have your typical situation where um, you've got a rain event and the tide is low, it's going to drain right through it as if it was an open pipe. Right. I'm not concerned about when it's low. Yeah. I'm concerned when they're both high. Oh, then it can't go anywhere. And that would be a fact whether we have check valves or not. Is there a possibility of putting a pump in there? At this time, no. It's something that we could look at retrofitting, but not now. And again, back to your, your first point, um, the, the way we can help mitigate, and why part of this project is raising the uh, elevation of the intersection, we mitigate that flooding by bringing the road up higher so that if it does, if you do have a tidal event, you have a road that now is at four feet instead of 1.8 feet elevation above I'm, sea level. I'm aware of that. Right. Where, where my concern comes in is when you have a great deal of rain that's now going to not be sitting on the intersection where it's going to be sitting will be on all of MLK. Well, I mean, if you're, the volume of water is going to be pushed through those pipes um, with the elevation of the road out of the way, it's, it's not going to offset it like you're, like you're thinking. We can show you the drainage calculations and I can walk, through, walk it through with you, but it's, it's not a major concern. Well, I'm glad we don't have a roundabout going in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a positive comment. Yeah, how to say it. Um, and, and like I said, I just hope that this follows through because I would hate to see this project start and just, you know, um, yeah. sit there. I, I've been by there numerous times and it's, it's a mess, you know, to have the salt water there. Yes, sir. So, I mean, I, I would 
try somewhere down the road to see if we could possibly put in some sort of, you know, small pumping system so as to move that water that is, um, I mean, I don't know what, what you have as far as a, um, a grading possibly along MLK where the water can run into that and just have a small s sump pump that can push that water um, to the, you know, to the bayou rather than having it sit there. Because I'd hate to just do all this and then just create another problem. And, and you know where I'm coming from I with do. that. Yes, sir. You could fix one thing and make uh, another problem. So I'm not overly concerned that what's going down Spring Bayou, it's MLK. Because all that water comes from Alt 19, all comes, you know, all the way down there. So that's all. I just. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, Vice Mayor Lott. Uh, Bob, what's the, what's the rise of this intersection going to be after we're finished with it from its current level? Um, so the average is now right around 1.9 feet uh -huh. elevation, and it's going to go up to 4. So the actual intersection is going to be at 4 feet? Yes. How are we going to accommodate that with the slope down Martin Luther King and the slope down Spring? So it's, it's designed to tie in smoothly it's, for both of those. So we're going to go down Martin Luther King and then back up? Uh, or are we going to raise that whole roadbed? We're raising the whole intersection so that it ties in. I understand in at, we're raising the intersection, but there's right. four, well, three roads that, that intersect with it, right? So Martin Luther King comes down slope into that intersection, as I remember. If we raise that intersection, then we're either going to have a, a, a place where it goes down and goes up again, or we're right. going to have to raise the whole of Martin Luther King. Now, the, the design accounts for that, and I could show you this, the, pro, the profile drawings well, there is that, a, that so account So we're for changing that. the slope of the road as well? To tie into the existing part, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, I'm good. I'd like to see the design of that. I don't want to pay armchair engineer here. Um, <laughs> But I will anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm also a fan of, I, I understand the check valves and so forth. I also understand the need that when we get, uh, you know, blue sky rain or whatever they call it, when we get heavy rain and high tides at the same time, that we may need an additional vault pump facility to, to force water out that check valve. Um, I know it's probably too late in the design process for this road, but we definitely need to start considering that every time we put in a check valve because there isn't a place that I'm aware of where the combination of the two wouldn't result in flooding again. And as it's been mentioned, uh, we have very few um, evacuation routes mm -hmm. from the west side of the city to get out. Um, as it is now, Bayshore, Martin Luther King, and, and uh, Whitcomb Road itself leading up to Martin Luther King are all gonna be inundated. Um, Riverside Drive between Beckett Bridge and, and pretty much pretty close up to Kramer is gonna be underwater. So these are the things we have to think about when we're doing this design is we are going to get a combination of those two. It will probably come at the worst time for us to get our residents out. Anyway, thank you. Sorry. Commissioner Kulias. Yes, I, I want to thank Mr. Robinson for the, the hard work he's put in and, and helping design this, uh, this intersection. And uh, Mr. Robinson's made it clear, and, and staff as well, it, it's, this project is not going to solve 100% all the flood issues at that intersection you know it's gonna help mitigate a big portion of those storm surges that you see during the summertime but as he stated there could be a certain couple situations where you know a couple times a year it, it's still high and uh, um, to design to have that fully taken care of I'm sure would cost a lot more than what this co uh, what this bid came out to and uh, we, we've seen from designs about doing the whole uh, Whitcomb Bayou with raising um, raising the bayou and gates and levee systems it can range from a few million to 40 50 million so it's, it's what we as a city can 
can afford to do and help mitigate, you know, as much flooding as possible. So right now we're at this stage. I know that the timing isn't great and uh, I know it's an inconvenience, but we got to push this city forward. And w these capital improvement projects have to happen at some point or another. And so it's important that we get this one done uh, way before the Beckett Bridge installation even occurs so that we could have one, at least one route to get out, you know, from people from the west side of town to get out in case of an emergency. So I uh, just want to make it clear this isn't the end all fix all for that intersection. It's a, it's a start in the right direction, and uh, we will have to consider some other stuff in the future, uh, but that's gonna come at a big cost that we still have to decide and, and, and talk about how we wanna handle, so thank you all. Thank you, Commissioner Koulianos. Commissioner Koulianos. Get those names mixed up. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I've got three questions for you. Um, have we used this contractor before? No. What uh, due diligence have we done on their timeliness and uh, abilities? So we che checked all the references they provided. We checked references, references they didn't provide. We checked with the DOT and we had them actually provide a, a long list of other projects that they've done primarily for DOT that are similar in size or scope or, um, yeah, size or scope. And they were, and they were timely. In, in, uh, all, so we, have, we didn't hear any negative. To, you yeah. spoke to other other uh, governmental agencies about yes, them and about their timeliness. Yes, sir. And obviously that goes to uh, what uh, Commissioner Koulias was talking about when, because we've got to coordinate this with the Beckett Bridge, because well, yes, that sir. would be a nightmare to have both those intersections out. Absolutely. Or that bridge out and that intersection being worked on, that would be a an emergency. Uh, catastrophe, right? It certainly would be a problem, yes sir. Yeah, it'd be a, a big problem. Um, so that's that's really important. So um, let me ask, this might be a, a Ron Herring question, but we received a, a spreadsheet uh, of all the projects and the estimated costs and then where they were coming from, ARPA funds um, and other sources. Is this, is this number 1,071,600 more than what was on your original spreadsheet, Ron? Uh, oh. yes, it is. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, Mayor Commissioners. The original amount was 990,000. Okay. Uh, the balance is coming from the penny fund. So 990, and now we're at 1,071,600. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know it's coming from the penny fund, but yeah. that, that's the grants money funding that won't a portion, and then we got the ARPA okay. money, and then. Um, Thank you. Sure. And believe me, the way the bids have been coming, we're very happy we were that close. No, I hear you. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Kulianis, is that it? That's it. Did you have a follow up, Commissioner Eisen? Thank you, Mayor. So I had a couple of questions. The check, the uh, check valve works for high tide. So explain to me then why there was no pumping system planned into this. Is that yours to plan? Is it the, who does that planning? Well, I guess that would start with me. Um, I think probably the main driver for that is it's a difference between what was at the time a four to five hundred thousand dollar project versus what if we looking at the sponge docks a four million dollar project. So in terms of cost effectiveness and, and functionality, um, bang for your buck, we don't necessarily need it for now. I appreciate your comments before and I think it is something we can look at too, augmenting as a, a later phase, supplementing it. Um, but I think this will be pretty effective for mitigating almost most of the flooding situations we see at this intersection. So here's what I have to ask you because I know a comparison was made to the Whitcomb Bayou, and now a comparison's made to the sponge docks. But that's not what I'm kind of looking at for this. The type of pumping system that we would need there is minute in cost and in functionality in comparison. 
it's in millions to deal with the do, you know with dodecanese because we're building halls. I understand that. That's a completely different project. The Whitcomb Bayou. You're talking about stopping the tide from coming in, berms building up the road. I'm not talking about that. Here we're correcting the problem, but we're not correcting the problem that it's creating. And I believe, because I, I know the answer to this, that's why I'm asking you the question. Um, the cost to put in a sump pump, a powerful sump pump, is not a lot of money, correct? Uh, it really depends on the sizing. And not, I can't not answer for your rain. question. I can't answer that question without doing the calculations, so I don't okay. know. Okay. Well, it's it's not a lot of money in, in the realm of a million-dollar project. It's more so, um, so that's why I'm, I'm really sticking to this, because I, I really don't want to do this as an after project. I don't want to do it as a forgotten project, because I know we have so many other things that, you know, when you're doing it is the time to do it. It's, it's the easiest. You build a little, you know, a, a small small volt, the pumping system, you have a hose, and it's pumping it right back out so that MLK is not flooding. I, I, I know you may not be able to get this looked at, but I would like to at least see if it's feasible, because anything we put in there is going to be better than putting nothing in there. We have electric on the road. Um, I just don't see it being a huge, it's not a million dollar project, you know, to do this. So if we can look at it at all um, while it's in the uh, construction end of it, I would appreciate that just to okay. see, okay? That's it. Um, let, me, let me just, uh, you know, this whole thing got started. You mentioned a roundabout. This is how this whole thing got started was a roundabout. It had, in all honesty, I was a commissioner. It had very little to do with flooding. The flooding was the means to get the roundabout in. People raised their, their they stated their concerns. Um, the roundabout went away, and we still had issues with um, flooding in that area. What this project is going to achieve, and, and you heard me not being completely confident, because I know it's not going to fix the problem, is be, it, it will raise the intersection to make that intersection passable over what it is today, period. That's what's going to happen. What I'm waiting to see, and then also the, our check valve uh, experience hasn't all been that great either. So we'll see what we've learned from that, and, um, and we'll see how this works, this, this um, implementation of the check valves work. Um, and then thirdly, um, I'm just hoping, because my big concern way back was uh, not pushing the water. MLK, I think, is going to be okay. It's Spring Boulevard, where it is the lower th area, and I was hoping that we don't push the water closer towards the, um, the homes along that area. So that's why I'm waiting to see. Um, I know that this isn't going to be anything new to Mr. Funchen that he's going to have to deal with these sort of things. And, and I know that our expertise in that is we, we learn as we've been going with, any, with each new s incident. And um, we need, I'm going to say a little bit more about that when we get into our, uh, um, our presentation on our large project funding that Mr. Herring and, and Mr. Cooley, or Commissioner Cooley Anderson are going to report on. But, but, I, but I think we need to get this thing done to raise the elevation. We, and, and if we don't do it now, um, we won't make it before the bridge gets started. And if the bridge gets started, then I, I know one thing for sure, people will be driving, all the people coming from the west side of the town will be driving through these sunny day tides. So we need to elevate that, uh, this intersection. So I understand. So um, if there's no further comments, um, We've done our public comments, uh, commission comments. I'd like to have a motion and a second to approve this project. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, if there's no further commission comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisenberg? Yes. Vice Mayor Lund? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Robertson. Ms. Lewis, thank you. Okay, um, item eight, update on the file 22001 uh, concerning the maintenance of the public restrooms at the Sponge Exchange. Commission, or City Manager, of course, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Yeah, I'll turn it over to Janina real fast. You see Janina and Tom. Of course, Tom was down there to 
to make sure we got the date. We had told you at the last meeting that the that the owner had said it was going to be done by the first of the month, and my goodness, it was. Um, so, Jenny, if you just want to go real fast, what we're, what we're approving tonight, because I think they've done what they've said they were going to do, and uh, what's been the purpose of tonight's meeting and the approval. Yes, thank you. Um, Janina Lewis, Procurement Services Director, Honorable Mayor, Commissioners, um, good evening. Uh, basically, this is just a follow-up, like the city manager mentioned, that they did complete their renovation and construction, and we're technically just asking for the approval from the commission to continue the final six months of the contract. We started in December and kind of gave them a little leeway, then we gave them another leeway in March to finish up by June 30th, and the initial payments, since they were under construction in June, we didn't provide anything, so now we're just looking for the final uh, approval of the contract okay. for this year. And then we'll okay. be back in December. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lewis. Are there any public comments on this item? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? And we do not have anyone in attendance at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, commission comments, I see Commissioner Eisner, you've got your light on, go ahead. Yes, I did take a trip over. I uh, did look at the bathrooms. They are really done well. Um, I mean, I only have one little suggestion. I don't know if I would have put pedestal slinks in just because they don't hold up over time in commercial uh, locations because they're easily broken. But, um, you know, the bathrooms per se, the tile work, the toilets, everything is, you know, looks pretty good. So I, I was pretty impressed. I, I'm, I'm going to go forward with this. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Kulias. Yeah, I just want to thank the, the board and city staff for working with the property owners and giving them the leeway they needed because uh, we needed that restroom. We need to be able to share that restroom with uh, down there for all the tourists, and uh, it worked out great. So uh, just hats off to everyone. Okay, anything else? Okay. Uh, if there's no further comments, can I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Um, roll call. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, item 9, discussion, direction on financing options and alternatives. Um, City Manager LaCourse, I assume Mr. Herring is going to start this off. Yes, there's some very hard work done by Mr. Herring and the commissioner that you put on board with us to, to work on this. Um, I sat in for a little bit, but many of these two gentlemen who did the work, so um i don't know what is it ron starting off or you know i gotta go first so uh so i, I want to thank uh ron he's he, ron's going to go through the um we, we call it the dragnet effect he's going to give you the facts only the facts ma'am and then i'm going to interject some uh things for you to think about so uh and then uh, uh, I may interject while Ron's talking, but of course, you're, 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 go ahead. <laughs> Good evening, Ron Herring, Finance Director, and this will be the Ron and John show here. <laughs> but um, what I did is my my slides going on, basically just to show you the current debt of the city, some information on the debt, and then some just some options and examples I put together for you all. Of course, somebody turned it off. Oh, here we go. <laughs> um, this is the current debt. This is the utility system revenue bond. I try not to go through everything, but it's uh, the current balance over highlighted in yellow is 28, $28.6 million on that. It's $28.6 million. Um, P&I annual payments are about $2 million a year. Interest rate 3.59%. It's funded by the Water and Sewer Fund. This fund, what this bond was a public offering. It is callable, just started this year, 2023, but not a good time, according to our financial advisor, um, during the interest rates have increased some, but he's monitoring it, he's on our list. Um, if the interest rates go down, he'll get with us and see about trying to refund these bond issues into a lower rate. Um, we have some capital leases on fire trucks. Uh, three of them currently, they're staggered, their five-year terms are just staggered out uh, every couple years. Uh, they totaled two million dollars. We did these out of the penny fund, so instead of having a fire truck hit with a million dollar cost, 
every time we bought a truck, we, just, we had favorable interest rates, and it sort of levels out some money and leaves some money available in the penny fund for other projects. Just some information on financing. Uh, we, the city tries to keep financing at a minimum. Um, uh, we don't have hardly, just besides the capital leases, we don't have much in the way of governmental financing. Um, in fact, I think we're one of the lowest ones in the areas as far as having little debt as far as from our governmental funds. Our, uh, our uh, utility system revenue bond had a AAA, AA minus rating. It's still holding firm with that rating. That's just on the water sewer system and the bond issue. And just for information, financing over 10 years has to go out for a referendum per the city charter. Uh, just some information on the debts. You know, why do you do? Why do you? Why do you go out for financing? You, know, you don't have the funding in the annual budget to mitigate rising construction costs. Uh, have future tax and ratepayers benefit from a capital project instead of going pay as you go? So you're having the future ratepayers pay for a project in the future. And historically, interest rates for municipalities are tax exempt, which makes them lower. Uh, couple of the two types of financing instruments are private offering or bank loan. It, the bond is bid out to banks. The, the bank with the lowest interest rate gets the loan. There are shorter timeline, lower issuance costs, smaller, usually for smaller projects, usually for uh, projects financing up to 15 to 20 years. Um, banks usually don't like to go over 20 years on bank loans. Then there's a public offering like the water and sewer bond was. You know, it's sold to the public. Longer timeline to issue, um, higher issuance costs, usually for larger projects, and financing up to 30 years. Uh, types of the financing options, there's revenue bonds, which is backed usually by one specific source, like the penny fund would be the backing for a revenue bond. Then there's covenant to budget and appropriate bonds. They're like a pool of all the governmental revenues that can be used to support it except for ad valerium taxes, and it doesn't include enterprise funds. Then there's the general obligation bonds, which are backed by ad valerium taxes and usually require a, a separate millage rate for it to cover it. I put together, there's just some examples and basically coming from the penny fund of say five million, Going from the uh, top one right there, say five, you, you finance five million for six years. I, I use six years because there's only six <coughs> years left on the current penny. We're hoping that you know the penny has been overwhelm overwhelmingly renewed at four times now, and hopefully it will be for a fifth time. But there's only six years left on the current penny. Four percent interest rate. This would be the annual P&I, total interest, total debt service. And I put this in here too, just to show that of this uh, annual P&I, it's 25% of revenue, so it's still leaving money in the, in the penny fund for other projects. And then five million for 10 years, same thing, 4% lower annual P&I because you're only going 10 years, and which means you're only using 16% of the penny fund. And the same sort of for, for the eight million for six and 10 years, you got a little higher, you got a higher annual P&I, which is also then using 41% of the uh, penny fund uh, annual revenues. And then 10 years, which lowers the amount of P&I compared to the 1.5 million, and lowers how much coming out of the penny fund at 26%. And then the same for 10 million. I want to interject, I want to interject a question. Sure. Uh, are, the, are the penny funds right now being um, utilized? For capital projects? For anything. Yes. In, our, in our current budget, are we using the penny funds? Yes. Okay, so if we use it for this, we don't have it for that. Well, that's what I'm trying to show up here, you know, how much money is left. Well, I understand. Okay. You but if, but for, it's, it, the mic. No. yeah, it, if you use it for this, you don't have it for that, correct? What, you, what we are right now using the penny fund, correct? Yeah. Well, I can have some slides a little further on to okay, show go ahead. the current projects go ahead. and, and just, how, you, how you go fold ahead. in this finance. Let me ahead. just jump in here a second. Um, just for the purpose of clarity, so everyone understands, can we just do Mr. Herring first and can, can complete, and then you, Commissioner Koulianis, and then bring out any questions concerning Commissioner, I mean, Mr. Herring's presentation um, once we're done with both of you? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. 
But this, I is mean, a <laughs> this isn't a surprise. We talked about bantering back and forth. Okay. But go ahead. Okay. Mayor doesn't like No more bantering. He doesn't like bantering. <laughs> I, I think I think we need to finish with one and then go to the other and then we can ask questions. In summation, this slide is just trying to show the different examples with the five million of financing, eight million, ten million over this either six and ten years and ten ten years, the annual P and I and how it affects the what money is left in what how much money it uses in the penny fund and then how much is left. So like I say, if you're using 25% to cover debt service, you still have 75% of the penny fund revenues left in that fund. I just mentioning down here again that the penny expires and the current penny expires 12, 31, 29, so we got six years left. Hopefully it'll be renewed. Um, if we go over 10 years, the best thing would be we uh, do the covenant to budget an appropriate bond if it's 10 years, since we don't know for sure if the penny will be renewed, but we hope so. Uh, current annual penny revenues are 3.7 million. They increase about 100,000 per year. Issuance and costs on a revenues bonds, if, if a revenue bond is done, about $50,000. And I just wanted to show you about three examples of slides of how it affects the penny fund and how it affects the uh, current five-year projects that are, that are budgeted and the fund balance. So I've just done, you know, the five million That's your fault? No. <laughs> so I did the five million at six years at 4%, eight million at six years at 4%, and then the 10 million. Um, a lot of numbers up here, but what it is showing for the five years is the current budgeted expenditures in the penny fund, 2024, 25, 26, 27, 28. And what, what I've done here is, okay, say we're doing five million of financing for six years at 4%. Here's the five million in, in 2024 that can be spent on whatever project you determine. Here's the debt service for that five million. Here's the other projects that are currently budgeted in the penny fund right here. And the important thing down at the bottom is showing how much fund balance is left after all these projects, including the debt service, is spent. So we're still in the positive. At the end of 24, we have 163,000, 604,000 in 25, 2.3 million in 26. 4.4 and then 6.5. Going to the next slide, the only difference between the slides is now we're doing 8 million of financing for six years at 4%. All these other numbers are the same, but here we got 8 million for projects that you might determine on what you want to spend on. Here's the debt service, which is more than the previous slide at the 1.5 million annual debt service. And as you can see down here, it's a lower amount of money left for fund balance in the penny fund than the previous slide, but we're still in the positive. We got 163,000, 40,000. Then we're going creeping back up to 1.3, 2.7, and 4.3 up through uh, fiscal year 28. And then the last slide of examples is uh, if we did same information again, 10 million of financing over 10 years at 4%. Here's 10 million for the projects. Here's the debt service for the uh, annual debt service. Lower than the previous slide because we're doing 10 years now. Same projects here. And here's the ending fund balance of money still available to spend, 163,000, 327,000, 1.8 million, 3.5, and 5.4 million. And I've got just one more slide just to say, you know, if you're choosing to do financing, the next steps would be to, to determine what capital projects do you want to be financed? What's the total cost of the capital projects? And then I would start working with a financial advisor who I've already been talking to for a couple months now to just get information and get his thoughts and, uh, and contact the city bond council on the financing who make sure all the legal, legal aspects of financing is done. I've already contacted him also, so we've already, I've already been in contact with both of them just anticipating it, whatever, you, when you go ahead with on financing here. Thank, thank you, Mr. Herring. And with that, I'll give Mr. Koulianis. Yeah, Can I interject on him? On him? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's fair, what's fair is fair. Anytime you want, anytime you want. So uh, Ron and I go way back, so we, we don't mind bantering a little bit. So um, this, so I'm, I'm giving you the Paul Harvey part, the rest of the story. Um, and these are just concerns that you all need to be aware, of. and and most of this is for the residents to understand. Um, this 
uh, slide up here is showing the, um, you can see our millage rate has not increased um, over the last, uh, since what, 2011. Um, our general fund revenue, you can see has gone, uh, has kind of gone with, you can see the, the, how does this thing work? No, 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 I wanna, no, I wanna, I wanna do the pointer thing. You need a new battery. Where's the thing? Is it on the side? Where, on, where? Does it go back to the? No, the, the, the laser thing, yeah. Sure. Where's the laser? Thing? Oh, I had it backwards. All right, okay. backwards. thank you, thanks, all right. <laughs> So here, here's, here's a thing that stood out to me. I, I went to uh, all the budget advisory meetings and I, and I saw this presentation, and this is actually Ron's slide. And you can see here at 2008 was uh, the peak, the last peak of ass assessed values, taxable values in Tarpon Springs. Um, and then you know, everyone knows what happened after 2008, we had a, uh, considerable drop, so it went from 1.9, um, uh, what was it, one, uh, one, was it one billion? Yeah, one billion, 900,000, and it dropped down to as low as one billion, 200,000. So we had a significant drop. You can see that we have this, and, and remember all these values, these assessed values are in arrears. So these are happening uh, so this is all last year's data. So you can see we're at a peak and everyone knows that their house today would not sell for what it would have sold for a year ago. We know there's been a drop. So we know this number is either going to considerably flatten or start coming down. And if we experience anything like 2008, then uh, that drop could be significant. And then you can see the, what that meant in revenue decrease as we dropped uh, 1.5 million in revenue from the, uh, the peak of what came from those funds. Okay, I'm going the wrong way, I see. Okay, so here is, um, I put this slide together. This is the ARPA funding. So we had, we received, we had received uh, $12,800,000 from the federal government in ARPA funds. We have encumbered already $12,197,000. We have unencumbered remainder funds of $600,000. Um, just like the conversation we just had with um, Mr. Roberts, Robertson on this MLK intersection, that has already gone up, that went up 8% from what we had originally uh, anticipated. So if we, if we have a 5% overage cost overrunning contracts, then we would have uh, basically a break even and we wouldn't have that 600,000 there. And even if we have, even if we're only pulling the money from here, that overage has gotta come from somewhere. And if we're 10%, which is more likely, um, and we've got other examples of some significant uh, cost overruns over what we anticipated, we would actually be 600,000 in the negative, which it would be if 10% would shoot uh, $1.2 million in the other direction. Again, those funds have gotta come from somewhere. And that's what the, the, the question uh, when I interrupted him so rudely, it was, um, that again, you know, in government, I don't come from government. I come from like the real world. So, oh, we just got a penny fund. We'll just take it from this or we'll take it from that. But it, it's money and that penny fund's always been accounted for for something. So if you take it from this, you got, it comes out of that. It's just the facts of life. Okay. Okay. 
So here is the, um, our overall uh, revenue uh, going back to 2018. So our total revenue, and this is really our budget, uh, was 56 million to 59 million, 61, 63, 66. We had a big jump from uh, fiscal year ended 2022 to 2023, um, up about 13%. And now we're, the budget that um, uh, Mr. Herring has put together is shows a pretty much a stable with last year, but we also know that some um, that some of the um, uh, the pay increases, uh, most likely for the police, and are, is that in here? Is it in total revenue? In for the next year's budget? Yeah. Yes. It is. Okay. So uh, it looks like we've stabilized anyways for that. But you can, again, we can see as the citizens will understand that our budget in, in, in about six, seven years has gone from 56 to 76. So it's, it's moving up. And again, we can account for it. But again, the concern goes back to here. It's th this rise, this rise, is these this rise okay so not trying to pour cold water on everything but i just want you uh, uh, the citizens this is again this is we're doing this more for the citizens to understand this coming down is going to create this coming down um I'm sorry, I'm having this thing. The battery must be down. Okay, so here's, um, here's our governmental reserve. Um, so we have to, uh, by law, maintain a 20% reserve requirement based on our general governmental activities budget. This isn't the whole budget, but this is the general uh, general governmental activities budget. And it's gone from 24, 25, 26, 27, 29, 33. Our actual, the amount that we have in reserves is eight, was 8.8 .8 million in 2018, and it has remained stable. And this is our estimate of where it will fall in uh, September, and it's gonna fall again right at the 8.8 .8 million. So the, our reserves have stayed steady but the excess, because, the, because our spending has gone up, the excess uh, funds are, is, is coming down. So it's about half, our excess funds above our 20% has, is about half of what it was um, six years ago. And this is a little, uh, kind of a sloppy, uh, slide but this uh, i pulled up um and and this uh, there was hundreds of these and this is just an example of uh, in a secondary market uh, of other municipalities and government agencies and uh, what their rates are <coughs> what they're paying on their coupon rates um, now these all these bonds here are selling at a premium because that five percent is actually higher than what the actual rate would be right now, and Ron's correct, it'd probably be in the, at four or maybe in the low fours. Um, but you can see that most of the, and the um, government, like they're using, here, like this was a, uh, pulled for a, a school board build, building, uh, this is for an airport, this is for an airport, um, this is for a school, this is a public service, um, uh, improvement to like the water supply. Um, this is a university and you can see, and most of them are things of significant nature. Um, so, and that like, and that's similar to what we have on our portfolio of bonds, which is uh, the water plant and things of that nature, right? And again, the important factors to consider before incurring any more debt is 
I'm concerned about the inflation, again, of all of our items um, that have, have been thought of but not yet spent. I want to go back to this real quick. Um, of this $12 million in the ARPA fund, even though $12,197 has been encumbered, uh, according to Ron, we've only spent a million. So the rest is still up in the air and could end up like our MLK uh, project. Um, and we even had another project that Ron pulled up for me. It was the Elfer Spur Pinellas Trail project that was approved by prior, a prior board that was 700,000 uh, initial approval that is coming in now at 1.4 million. So let's go back here to the, to the summary. Um, again, inflation's the big thing. We just, gotta, we, don't, I, we just have to get a handle on what all these costs, these overruns for outstanding contracts and projects. Um, we've got increased uh, operating budgets. Uh, we've got a possible dropping in assessed values that could happen. We have a, um, we, we see the reduction in our excess reserves, so we gotta be concerned that we don't, that, that we don't raise government so high that our reserve issue becomes a problem. And, um, and, and I think we all got a phone call from uh, 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 Tommy on uh, possible rate increases on even water uh, and sewer usage. So we know that there's gonna be a direct rate increases that are gonna to go to residents. So that's it. I, just, I think that our goal here was to lay out the, pro the ideas, and, um, and Ron had a, has, definitely has ideas on how to pay for the 1.8 million for the, um, or one, yeah, the 1.8 million for the Roosevelt without having to borrow money, that we do have the funds to take care of that from uh, what we believe is available. So um, that, uh, again, we go through this whole budget process with the understanding that um, these are some facts that we have to, to address and take into consideration when we think about uh, incurring more debt. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Koulianis. Let's go to uh, public comments. Are there any public comments concerning the presentation? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Let's go to commissioner comments. Uh, commissioner Eisner, you've got your light on. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, I did look at this and I think we're at a peak of our interest rates um, and inflation. So, I mean, unless we have a project that is pertinent that really has to be done, I'm leaning towards not getting involved with it unless it has to be done uh, because of literally what you know what John just said, Commissioner Kulianis. I'm Commissioner Kulianis. I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm not looking to take on debt because once we take that on, we're stuck with it. Um, I, if it's something that is an emergency or something that really we need to get done, I just I think uh, waiting. Um, is is a because we still there's there's other things that have come up that you know we still haven't dealt with the uh the spring bayou we still haven't dealt with the uh, sponge docks with the volts uh we th there's just a, a string of things that could come up so that that's where i'm at I, okay. i'm not looking to um change our uh, ratings we have a good rating here and i don't want to borrow money that we can't pay back um, I'm going to go to this side, uh, Vice Mayor Lawn. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm also tend to agree with uh, Commissioner Iser. I'm in a, I'm more in a wait and see mode right now. There, there's no projects that we have totally outlined on the horizon that I'm going to go and say, yes, we need to put the city in debt for this. 
Um, currently, we're seeing construction rises that, that are just between 20 and 45 percent. It's incredible. They're not, they've got to level out at some particular time. N nobody's going to be able to sustain this level at some time. Um, again, with the, the property market and our, and our taxes, as, uh, as John pointed out, we're starting to see that kind of trend down a little bit. Um, I don't think we're going to do a repeat of, of uh, you know, the, the early 2000s or the 2008 type stuff where we see a real big dip. I think there's just too much support right now for that, but I'd like to see it settle out a bit more rather than making a decision in 2023. I think we may want to pen this off to 2024 till we have a maybe a clear outlook on what's coming up. Um, you know, there's there's reasons that cities bond themselves into debt, and they're typically for projects that there's no way they could ever get them done without doing that. Just like our RO plant, um, people's city halls, um, just major construction projects that take up to 20 or 25 percent of the, the city's total budget. And I don't see anything like that on for us on the horizon right now. The Whitcomb Bayou project sort of comes to mind because that's really expensive. Um, that only serves a small part of our population, however. Um, things like the much needed expanded recreation, sports center, pool, stuff that the, <laughs> the residents, quite frankly, have been asking for for as long as I've been listening to them, which has been a while, um, certainly bear more scrutiny. I mean, we, we can't say, well, we can say, well, yeah, put a rec center or, or whatever expanded recreation facility and, and courts and stuff like that on the landfill, but we don't even know if we're allowed to do that yet because we don't have any engineering that says, yes, we can build that. So those kind of things need to be done in advance. Um, at any rate, I, I'm kind of on a hold, but thank you for listening. Commissioner Kouliars. Yeah, I have the same concerns as uh, the board members here, um, but we have to identify if there are any projects that do need to be bonded, and if, if it does need to happen, which I'm hesitant, I would prefer the six-year terms just because uh, some of us board members may be on the board here, another, you know, again, would for another two and a half to you know five years or so and so I think we should be stuck with having to work with the budget or any capital improvement projects from uh, you know a bond that we, we took out as opposed to a 10-year term that would extend it into future boards and and future budgets so um, we would learn how to work with that situation but I just let's see if we can identify something but you know we promise to fix the roads and sewers and floods and so let's see if we can come into it without going through a bond. Okay. Did y'all want to, oh, Commissioner Kulianis, go ahead. Um, I, you know, I, I, the vice mayor was um, succinct in, in the, and that's what I tried to show on the, um, when I showed those various bonds that uh, other municipalities have issued, they're usually big, projects, airports, water treatment plants like we did. I think the, the thing that comes to mind that I would think would warrant the debt would be the uh, fixing the rest of the bayou. I think that's a pretty critical thing uh, because that is the focal point of our town. That is where we you know, have the epiphany, where we do everything is that bayou. So having, and again, we don't know the total effects of only doing half and what it does to the other half. Um, so something along that line that's, that's such, of such significance that would be of benefit for everyone going forward for you know, the next 20 years. And it would warrant the debt because the debt, what we don't wanna do is, it's like you, you go buy a car uh, on a 10-year note 
and, and, you, and the car is a jalopy after six years, so you're paying on a car that's of no value to you. Um, so that's, that's what you gotta be concerned with. So something like, again, f completing our, uh, that Bayou, that's gonna be a benefit as long as the bond, uh, any, even if we win 30 years, it's gonna be a benefit. So if we hand that off, that debt off to the next, to another commission, they're getting that benefit as well. So I agree with uh, Commissioner Koulias as well, because if, if we go into debt, we don't want the debt to pass on to another board uh, again, where the benefit was short term. So, thank you. Okay. Um, I sat down with uh, Mr. Herring just to try and get an understanding of what the objective for this evening was, and obviously I can't talk to Commissioner Koulianis about it. But he, uh, the whole idea was just to kind of uh, set the stage for uh, funding challenges, and I call it large project funding. And um, some of the debt that it, what the ramifications would be and the consequences for that as far as encumbering future revenues. And then the other part of that story, and, and then the, the last question that uh, Mr. Herring had was, okay, now I've showed y'all what we can do as far as the cost of borrowing money. Y'all need to tell me what is it that y'all wanna do. And then I can put the two together and kind of give you what the bottom line is. So. Um, from my perspective right now, um, I'm not ready to kind of say, make up, give an opinion one way or the other until we actually go through the budget. The first step of that's gonna be um, beginning tomorrow night uh, with a capital project as well as the general fund overview and the other uh, fund, uh, revenue fund overviews. Um, but just let me give a couple of examples. Chief Young, um, if you don't mind, Commission, or say manager, of course, okay. Um, we, we got a, a new fire truck recently, right? And it's in production or something? Yes, we're waiting for okay. it to be built. And the reason why we bought it then rather than waiting when we were supposed to was why? Two, two things. The delay in building was put out about two years, <clears throat> and the rising cost of the trucks jumping at the time. There's a general increase of 3% normally on the fire trucks, but they were seeing 15 and 20% price increases at the time, so we were trying to get ahead of the game time-wise and cost. Okay, so there's 20% is what we're looking at for that. And then also, uh, Commissioner Quillianis mentioned the, um, the trail there at the north end of town. We've also got the uh, Chief Young, uh, the fire station, what was our, you, you're involved in that too, right? We are. The, the original estimate was on, based on last year's numbers and what we have this year. Uh, both you and Ron can work this one out. Yeah, this we is the firehouse uh, 71, right? 70. 70. 70. 5.5 million. And then, and what was it? The, we just received one cost estimate at 30%. <clears throat> We're getting another uh, cost estimate coming in. What was the, the original amount though? The original amount we, Budgeted was 5.5. And, and, but hasn't there been an increase what, over what we had originally predicted and what we were planning on spending? For about yes. 7 million. Yes, about 7 million. 7 million. From 5.5 up yes. to 7 million. Yes. Okay. And then also, um, the one thing that we've talked about, which is something that is important to a lot of people, is uh, the Cops and Kids Center, which isn't even in our. We haven't even allocated funds for that yet, right, Mr. Herring? Uh, we just did the design work of 600,000 out of the ARPA money, but there is no money for construction. For the $5 million, whatever it is, the price that right. we're looking at. I, I, I think the key is that um, there are projects that we don't have funding for mm -hmm. that may or may not be important. You know, so my point is, uh, Mr. Herring and Commissioner Koulianis provided us the front side as far as what our capacity is for paying for things, including the debt. There's the back side of what we want to do. And then there's the third thing, which is really the probably the most important, I think all of you all alluded to it, is creating some kind of a, 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 a strategy as far as priorities. 
There's no way, um, and I, I asked for uh, city manager of course today, we did do a shopping, I don't call it a shopping list, but basically a list of all the CIP big ticket items. I think Commissioner Culliado, when you mentioned $30 million on Whitcomb Bayou, you weren't far off on that. So that's something that we can't just dip into our cash and pay for. Same thing with the uh, Cops and Kids program. $5 million is not anything we can go just go get. Um, the increase in fire trucks, police vehicles, seven police vehicles every year, those are gonna go up. There's a whole lot of things that are going up. And, and these, many of these things we, we have to keep up with. If we don't keep up with it, mm -hmm. it it's, it, we're gonna pay the price dearly. So the idea is to develop some kind of a strategy and I don't, we need to do that sooner than later and so if y'all can start thinking about that, and I'm hoping that, um, I asked the city manager if he can provide us, go back and dig up that list of things that we, that were kind of like, I asked him at one time, put down everything that we need, you know, the, the Whitcomb Bayou, the everything else as far as what estimated costs, the best numbers that we have right now, let's actually look at the amounts. And that's what kind of got us started on this, this whole discussion right now of large project funding. I, I know we can't afford it all, so there's got to be a priority. And, 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 and on top of that, the, what I mean by a priority is there's things that it, it's going to be a little bit of a tough situation where residents are going to want something, but it's not going to be in terms of a priority. And what this commission is going to have to decide is, are those things going to go to the, to the voters to tell, ask them, you know, is this important for you? to have, and if so, this is what it's gonna cost for us to borrow. And, um, and, 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 and my, from my perspective, if there is something that, uh, the other part of it is the uh, second half of the sidewalks Commissioner Koulianis mentioned, from the, um, from the city dock to the north and west, we don't have funding for that right now. So there's a lot of things right now that seem to be important we feel that they're important, but we just don't have the money to pay for it, and we know what the risks are and, and the potential for doing that. So we need to have a strategy. And, and from my perspective, um, I don't have an issue going for longer-term debt as long as the residents approve it. Uh -huh. um, you know, if it's, if it's something that we need, let's say some $15 million project, and even, even that we could pay for it in less than 10 years, I think that's something that we need to go to the residents and ask them, is this important for enough for you to, for us to go ahead and borrow that money? Once that happens, it doesn't matter whether it's this commission sitting here or some other personality sitting there in the future, the, this is what the voters wanted. Good point. So that's how I'd like to approach it. But anyway, that's all I wanna say about this. I think it was an excellent job. Um, go ahead, Commissioner Eisner. Yeah, I, I wanted to add something. Um, Chief Young, I'm sorry, I didn't see you sit down. I wanted you to tell the story to the commission of what you made mention to me about the uh, firehouse that they were building in Pasco County, is it? Yes, uh, Pasco County is building a fire station. I heard the other day that they, their contractor left the job and uh, was sitting there. So I don't know the specifics of it or if it's you know 100% is what's going on, but that's out there. I mean, the contractors are having a hard time today too, keeping up. So. Yeah. so my point that I'm trying to bring up, we have to be very careful about what projects we decide to take on in high interest rates, high inflation, um, and having the ability for contractors to just decide to take a better job, go belly up, walk, yeah. Um, you know, it's a very, very difficult time to get into things that uh, are not um, mandatory for us. It, it's just not, a, in my opinion, it's just not a good time to speculate. Right. So. Okay. Commissioner Koulianis. Uh, again, I think we need to get through this budget process. Um, we need to get through some portion of the year. We'll see a lot of things. Uh, uh, come to fruition, whether uh, assessed values drop precipitously or not. Um, I agree that um, I'm 
in, in citizens having decisions. But again, this board um, is, is we have, we were elected to make a lot of the tough decisions. We can't kick it to citizens because let's just be honest, they, and, we, and I've had this talk with the city manager before, they're, you know, the, we send to the citizens to approve things we know we can afford, okay? They don't have all the data we have. They don't have, it. when they, when it says we're buying, we, we want to buy uh, the Roosevelt property for 1.8 million, there's not a qualifier at the bottom that says, oh, by the way, we don't have the money for it, okay? We don't throw that on there. We say we got, and so when they see it on a ballot, they believe we have already made, uh, that we have figured out how to pay for it. So uh, I appreciate sending things to citizens and having citizens make decisions, but we were elected to make those hard choices. And what we send to them is only things we have vetted properly and we know how we're paying for them. So that's, that's all I, I'm gonna I say guess, on that. I, guess I appreciate, and again, I appreciate the, it's, it's again, citizen involvement, but we make those hard, hard choices. If you borrow money for lo longer than 10 years, this commission doesn't make that call. And what I'm suggesting is that there may be a project of such importance that we need to borrow the money. That's the only way that we're gonna be able to borrow without jeopardizing anything else. I said that and before, if that's I the, agree. Well, if that's the case, then, then it's a charter decision. And the, the question is, do you wanna borrow, does the, do the residents wanna borrow X number of dollars for this? That answers the question of how much it's cost and also we don't have the money to pay for it. We're asking you, do you want us to borrow it? So I understand that we, we- We can go back and forth all night long on no, this. No, no, my you have point the gavel, to you but is it's the, the age old- But we have, it's, I, again, we send to them what we think is prudent and advisable for us as a citizen right. city to do. We, we don't throw, again, I, I understand the charter that if it's over 10 million, it's gonna I, go to them. I'm, I'm I, gonna understand, be I understand all that. I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I'm never gonna say, I say I'm gonna second guess what the residents want. I'm never gonna say that I'm smarter than them and, and I'm gonna make a decision for them and they may just decide, well, well this is something we really, really want, contrary I, to what I this didn't, commission did I, may I want. I didn't say that. No, no, but okay. that's basically. No, I mean, that's what you're inferring. I'm, I'm saying that and that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we make a decision. We are elected to, to send to them the things we believe uh, uh, we have vetted properly and that we can afford. But, That's huh. it. That's all I said. We, but, I mean, we can go back and forth all night, but that, I don't want you to leave with this, with the, the, I'm not the, 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 that I said, I don't believe in the citizens. I obviously believe in the citizens, but again, but, we were elected as well. So what I'm that, trying to say is this is not a black and white matter and you can't just say one thing or another. And there may be an occasion where we have to go to the residents and ask them their, their, approval it may not happen but it may happen and I'm, I'm all I'm getting at is that it would be our job to educate them to share with them as much information that we have and I'm not about to say I'm not going to send something to the Commission uh, or to the voters uh, because we're here to vet something and, and only send them on things that we can afford there may be some things that we can't afford that they're going to have to weigh in on as our charter as our charter states that's all um, Vice Mayor Long. You know, I'm, I'm listening to this conversation and parts of me agree with both of you. Right, exactly. It, from my perspective, the citizens can tell us what they want. The citizens can tell us what they need. It's our job to make that happen. That's what we're here for. We have to make it in a responsible, pragmatic fashion. So. I mean, citizens come up and say they want the world, but if it's, if it's not a practical, pragmatic thing for the city to do, it, it's not gonna happen. So while I don't believe we could take everything to the citizens to make a decision, because a lot of times citizens are gonna make more emotional choices than us with all the facts and figures that we, that we get in background. Um, I do believe we should listen to what the citizens want I do believe we should listen uh, very closely to what the citizens need. But I think as, as, as uh, Commissioner Kulianos was, was pointing out, is it takes 
of the pragmatic group of us to, to sit there and analyze things and make a, a decision as an elected representative that this is the most responsible way to accomplish what the citizens want and need. And that's okay. all I can say. I'm in agreement. All right. Um, what I wanted to say was, I think it was an out to finish up before I turned it over to Commissioner Eisner. I think what was done tonight was an outstanding effort on the front half. We're going to start looking at the budget as far as what projects are going to cost, what we have to do, um, what we have available as far as funding some of these projects, and we'll make decisions as we go along as far as how we want to approach it. That's all. It's good. All right. Fair. All right. We don't need a vote on that particular item. Do y'all want to take a break? No? Okay. Ratification of appointment of building director, city manager of course. Yes, by the charter, um, I have to bring my appointments of directors before you. Uh, this is the position of building development director um, from Mr. Kevin Powell. Um, we were very lucky when Mr. Powell gave us his resignation um, that he agreed to stay on and put that ending date on hold because he knew of the difficulty it was probably going to be to find somebody for this job. And we did a very thorough reach out throughout the state for this position, and we only came up with two qualified candidates. Um, and we were lucky they're both, it worked for us or it worked for us before. Um, Mr. Dave Gilson is the one I've negotiated and want to offer the job. You can see he worked here for six years. Um, he left here as deputy building official. He left to, for advancement of the building official other place. He left for advancement. Mr. Mr. Powell, we anticipated Mr. Powell to be here, you know, not forever, but for a long time. So he took the opportunity in 2020 to go move forward and actually be the building official. Um, you have on here the terms I've negotiated, which believe me, if you talk to other cities like I did at the city manager's conference in May, um, many of them who were looking for this but could not find somebody for the job and are having to contract with third party vendors that double this cost you're seeing in my backup and they're paying double um, to contract the third party because a lot of people in the field have been hired away from cities, work for these contractors and they and the person they work for make a whole bunch of money. This is one of the toughest jobs in the state to find and fill. I think we got a good hometown discount from Mr. Gilson. Um, I believe he's making 125 now and could probably write his ticket for some more other places, but he wanted to come back to Tarpman, which he knows, he knows the people here. So I think this is a, a great um, deal to bring him on board. If it's ratified tonight, his anticipating starting date is July 27th of, of this month. So I bring forward Mr. Gilson for your approval per the charter for me to hire as the building development director. Uh, are there any public comments concerning this item? Mr. Jump, are there any public comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any commission comments? Go ahead. I'm thrilled that he's willing to come and work for us. Um, my only comment that I'd make is I would, uh, you know, I know he's jumped around a little bit and I'd like to, you know, have him make a real good commitment that he would stay with us, you know, for a period of time. And that's pretty much, uh, I've said that to the city manager. Um, I just don't want to go through people, have them trained, uh, know our town, which I know he does, and, and then, you know, m move on. So the track record for him moving around is, is a lot. And that's, I, I would like to make sure that he stays with us. Okay, that's it. Is there anybody else that's got a comment? Anybody? I have investigated Mr. Gilson 
and Anna Maria and, and so forth and the situations going on. Does he live in the Tarpon Springs area? Because I noticed on his, there was no address on his application, but it said he wanted to move closer to Yes, home. he lives in North County. I don't believe within the city, but he does live in North, North Pinellas does County. Does live in North Pinellas County. Okay, so um, I understand as well it's a, that he's, he's jumped around a bit. And I don't think that's mid-career or mid-late career. I don't think that's totally untenable. I mean, if I was doing the same job and I looked for opportunity and I wanted progression and I was in a position where that wasn't going to happen for several years, I'd look elsewhere as well. Um, I also think his, his decision may have a little bit of, uh, I don't know, um, A little bit to do with the fact that that you know uh, where he's coming from just lost a lot of their home rule on certain things that were in the building department that would force me to to have pause about my future as well so I'm 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 in, in all of that considered when I looked into it I'm I'm actually in agreement I think we should hire him back Is there any other Commission comments y yes mayor I'm uh, if you guys get a chance to get with the city manager just to learn a little bit of the background regarding the building department and the current situation, and I think this is a good fit, bringing someone in. Uh, his, looking at his uh, resume, he, he has uh, reasons for, for where stuff did and didn't work out and eventually looking to come back home. And uh, um, it's either that or we get a third-party vendor and pay three times the amount for, you know, building consulting services, which we don't want. So <laughs> we're, uh, let Mr. Gilson's our, our guy now and happy to see the building department move forward and, and for us to find ways to continue to help the building department flourish. Thank you. Okay. All right, if, uh, may I have a motion and a second? Motion to approve. Second. Okay. If there's no further comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Fulianis. Yes. Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lund? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, update designation of acting city manager, city manager, of course. Yes, this is also something that, that is by charter. Uh, and in some housekeeping and things doing, I realized that I neglected to replace Bob Cochin, who was on this list. Um, of three that I've presented back and forth of three people and I realized and uh, as some of you as some of you know we also have one of my choices on here retiring by the end of the year so I only have two people on here with vacation time and everything else um, you know I've given the board three in the past I only had two because I hadn't replaced um, Bob Cochin so my recommendation to you to add to the list of of, of people who I make city manager, which is again, per the charter. It also says in the charter that the commission can, anytime if it's for a longer period than my vacation, then change that, it's not, the commission is not set by that. But to do that, um, um, Fire Chief uh, Scott Young is the one who I recommend to take the place and uh, be on that list of three that for my absences, for conferences, vacations, or, or whatever purposes, which are all short-term absences, you know, not long, um, and again, if there was a case of a long-term absence or something like that, the commission would always have a chance to designate who they saw fit. But um, the housekeep and uh, keep up my three on the list um, to bring forward. Uh, for instance, if Mr. Smith is not available to serve that, which he is the primary one who serves that, um, I need your approval to, to place him on, on the list of three that I have um, to designate as acting city manager in my absence. Are there any public comments on this item? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Um, Commissioner Kulias, do you have a comment or is that just off? No, that, that's okay. still off. Are there any fire. commission comments on, on what the city manager is proposing? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Vice Mayor. I, I guess I, I, I know you've probably vetted this already, but for my edification, if Paul's not available, do you have enough slack, Scott, to be able to 
to, to do this? Well, it might be, you can come to start time and I'll give from my perspective. I'm sorry. I, yeah. yeah. No, that's okay. No, because I want him to say too, because that's an important thing in my consideration. He was a lucky, he's lucky enough to when I served in his capacity for what was supposed to be six months, but ended up eight years. I had the strong ability of the people under me, my second in command, my third in command, my Jane. Scott's advantage over some of the other departments and department heads where I don't have that is that he's got a capable second, third, and fourth, whichever you go. Again, I had Bob Cochin, I had Jeff Young, I had plenty of people to serve that capacity of a couple weeks and do it. I think his advantage over the other department heads, and you all know the work and what's going on under him, he has the capacity with, with who he has under him to take over and take those reins um, if, if he's into the spot where, and I can't remember the last time I took it two weeks, the longest I think I takes a week and stuff, but mm -hmm. some reason I'm in capacity in the time for three weeks or minus, or, you know, somebody to be able to share that and stuff. That was the reason that was one of the main reasons looking at the other department heads why I chose him, and you can go ahead and reiterate that. that that's yes. my reason for selection. To, to answer your question, yes. Um, as the city manager says, I have a, a great staff. My number one, my number twos, I have basically two of them, run everything pretty much, keep everything in che uh, check. Uh, recently, city managers had me do some other additional things in the city. Uh, I have not missed a beat at my department. Everything is still running the way it was. Uh, all along, so yes, I, I have the capacity. I can I can do what I need to do. Okay, good. I just you know my concern would be I didn't want a disadvantage or a department. No. Mm -hmm. so. Not at all. I wouldn't let as that happen. As long as you're you're fine with it, and this isn't something you're doing just to be politically correct or something. No, like that. no. If I, if I if I if I didn't feel I could do it, I would tell him. No, I can't do this. Right. Thanks. I wouldn't do that to my Appreciate department. It. So. No more comments. Yeah, I, uh, I had that similar conversation with the city manager. He, he knows my feeling about public safety and its importance in the city, and that we have two chiefs, and their commitment is to public safety. And I don't want that to get distracted from what they would be doing in, in administrative. So, we'll, uh, But this is for acting city manager. You're not talking about making... Uh, administrative services director or anything like no. that okay no. so this is in, in when you're gone yes okay. when I'm gone. I understand that part all right um, if there's no further Commission comments uh, roll call please we need a motion did we have a motion no motion no. I'm sorry motion to a motion approve in a second. second okay roll call please Commissioner Koulianis yes Commissioner Koulias yes Commissioner Eisner yes Vice Mayor Lunt yes Mayor Vatikiotis yes all right, item 12, uh, discussion direction on Charter Revision Commission. Um, do you want to talk about it? Do you want me to talk about it? Well, again, let, let me start off and I'll turn it over to you because it's something of my mind too. Uh, obviously, we're coming up to the time, which would be next year, of a new Charter Commission. Um, but there's some advantages, again, with everything we've got going with the strategic plan, the comprehensive plan. Um, there's, there's probably, there's been some need from some past questions that's happened from the previous charter committee and some things to deal with. There's gonna be some future thing. So the thought is that this process, there would be, there'd be no harm in, in starting this project a little bit early. You're not talking about too much, but one of the discussions is of, of when to set this up, when to go through the process. And I think having this talk early can set us up for, for what the timing is gonna be and when we per, put this committee together and uh, to help us with some decisions and policies and changes. And I'll turn it over to you, Mayor, yeah, to talk no, I, more I, specific concerns about Right, there were, there were a couple of things like, um, I've been approached by a couple of uh, times by uh, former Charter Revision Commission members. Actually, they're still there. We haven't disbanded the, the, the past one of which I was a member, but uh, one of them was raising the cap of the, uh, of, of the uh, ability to borrow, for the city commission to borrow or purchase land more than 350,000, but it could get complicated. We talked about some autonomy for the planning and zoning commission as well, and that would be more complex where I think that there needs to be some dis uh, lengthy discussion. We did, as a commission, propose a couple of charter amendments um, that came, that were approved this last uh, election and the commission can always do that but going into the future and I think what the city manager was 
saying was that a little earlier would be to convene it in April, May, May timeframe of 2024. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the 2025 election in March. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, that, because we've got the uh, special um, council report that's going to come out, I'm sure there may be some policy changes that we may want to see go into the charter. There's some, um, as I mentioned, the autonomy, some autonomy for the PNZ board that can be discussed at there at the, at the Charter Revision Commission and let them come back with some recommendations. And we could have some things coming out. Like for example, the sustainability action plan um, is not part of the charter. We did the strategic plan. That may be something. I, I spoke briefly with um, um, Robin Reeves and also I think it was Paul Smith at the time of that's something that they want to think about at the staff level to see if they if that should be part of the charter so that um, the residents say that they want to keep this plan in perpetuity so some future commission or some future commission doesn't over period it just kind of fades away and we don't have it anymore it's not just that but also to keep up with it so the idea was that um, we have a, 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 we can establish one now, which would be really, really a short fuse to get anything done, or wait and take the approach of of, of convening one in in the early um, in the spring time frame of 2024, which any referendum questions to that would be put at the election in 2025. And by the way, that is a requirement. That would be our five-year period, right? Yes. Okay. That was, we are required to do one every five years, and that would be the next stop. That would be the time requirement would be for the 2025 election. So um, let me go to public comments. Are there any public comments on this item? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. Okay. Are there... Uh, and we do not have any raised hands. Okay. Any commissioner comments on this? Any preferences or? Yeah, I. Uh, we've got a lot going on with strategic plans and comprehensive plans and and sustainability plans and trying to dovetail them all together and get them into a, a workable model. I think the idea of moving or having the 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 uh, charter revision committee meet next spring for the 20 for the 25 years is, is an excellent idea i think it's, it's just otherwise it'd just be too soon too much are there any too many moving parts comments? Commissioner Cooley, I, yeah i agree with the vice mayor especially in regards to the special consul report i think it's important we see that because there could be some important uh recommendations in there so. okay any other comments if not, I'll just go for a motion and a second, and we'll just uh, motion second to um, re, re, we. Um, I don't want to say reconvene, but to convene a charter revision commission in, let's just say the spring of 2024. So moved. Second. second. Are there any further commission comments? No, I, th I think that's I'm the vice. Go I ahead. think I think vice mayor brought up a good point. It's good timing after all these other plans get done and yeah. uh, gives us enough yeah. space. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Um, I just had a quick question. Do we say convene or we would have to appoint a new charter commission? We would have because to appoint them. three members we don't have right. currently. Yeah, we would have to. It, when, when, then that's what I meant was reconvene or convene. And we would convene a brand new charter revision commission. Is that clarified? Yes, yes. and I put and, the process we did last time in there. Okay. Yeah. And who seconded it? I'm sorry. A new charter review. Well, who seconded it? Yes. Oh, um, Vice Mayor did. Vice Mayor Lunt did. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Koulianis? Roll call. Please. Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vaticiotis? Yes. Yes. Did I say yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, item 13. Authorize staff to create amendment to land development code establishing maximum time limit um, for the implementation of the development projects. This is something that um, is in the backup of, uh, you know, basically um, a question. It actually came up 
when um, uh, you know we, we were given the um, uh, combination of public records requests and also the litigation that came up and I was looking at the charter and um, and it kind of came to mind as far as the approval that was done without a um, an expiration date and I looked at the charter with this same thing with about the 10-year period so I, I posed the question to the uh, uh, special counsel Ms. Kardash um, offered her opinion on it and I've included that in the backup on that and um, uh, basically her point is that this is a different type of uh, 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 you know in terms of land development it's something that would not be applicable to uh, or the charter re requirement of the 10-year period would not be applicable to this part of it uh, but nevertheless it does create a situation where um, and, and this, in, in fairness, I have had conversations with Mrs. Vincent, and she agrees with this as well, although she's not here to speak for herself. Um, but basically, um, it creates a situation where once it's approved and the site plan is a, a, a building permit is applied for, and, and what we mean by building permit is not just the building permit as of the Florida Building Code, but a construction permit for grubbing, clearing, and so forth. Um, applied for doesn't mean issued just applied for and there's no other language in that uh, land development code section 210.05 um, then the developer could break ground in a year it could break ground in 20 years and we basically um, transferred certain development rights to that parcel without any expiration date and I'm not sure given what the Charter says that is what we um, it, it given that's what we would have intended or at least the residents would have intended so um, it, it's something that I think that we need to address um, sooner than later and then um, and Ms. Vincent already gave one kind of a preliminary approach to doing that which is a very simple thing and um, and, and it would just be changing the language of that section 210.05 and then also um, I did have conversations with Ms. Kardash and where, where she comes in where you apply for a building permit she kind of a, attached to that the Florida statutes which provide some uh, protection as far as expirations which would be the Florida statutes 553 which is um, uh, related to the Florida building code but by our definition it doesn't matter whether it's a Florida Building Code type permit that's applied for our, our own local version of, of a, con, a construction permit, which doesn't carry anything. So I think, as I mentioned, City Manager, there needs to be a cleanup of the definition on that to make sure that, we, you know, that when we mean, if we mean building permit, we really mean building permit under the Florida Statute 553, the Florida Building Code. So, um, and then the other thing that Ms. Kardash brought up, which uh, quite frankly, I, I was thinking that we had a little time in this, was, uh, and Mr. Salzman, if you, I'm gonna catch a cold on this, I'm not sure if you can help, but October 1st, uh, uh, the governor signed into effect a, a bill <coughs> that come October 1st, whatever changes we make as part of the land development code we need to analyze what the economic impact is to anything, businesses, developments, and so forth. And so what Ms. Kardash suggested was if the commission wants to make a change, we should try and do it before right. October 1st. Not, not only the impact, the cost to do that, the benefit for the city. Right. So the, all these requirements are gonna be more extensive, you're going to spend more money, uh, documentation, getting all those things ready, yes, yeah. effective October 1st. So I had two recommendations there. One was just a direction to the city staff to whatever development agreement um, comes forward between now and whenever we change the ordinance that a specific um, expiration date is made as a condition of that development agreement. That's number one. And then the second part would be to direct the staff to um, begin amending uh, crafting an amendment to the land development code that uh, establishes a time limit for developments whether they're part of a development agreement or just a uh, like a plan development that was what was done for um, Anclote Harbor 
or any other, uh, just a site plan, whatever it is, there's got to be something beyond that applying for a building permit that actually establishes a, a, a particular, uh, I, I don't know what they would be, that would be up to the commission to make that decision, but right now we don't have that. So that would be the second recommendation for this evening. And, and I guess from what I understand from Mr. Salzman, Ms. Kardash, we should do that before October 1st. Yes. So those are, that's what I've got. Let me go to public and see if they've got any comments and we'll come back to the commission. Are there any public comments on this item? Protus 901 Bayshore Drive. We have some lawsuits coming in the city. You mentioned Anclote Harbor. If this is passed now, what ramification would it have on that development and other developments that were going to come into the city because of rising costs they are holding back? Will these developments that have been approved? grandfather in or is this going to affect any they're, they're, grandfathered they're all grandfathered in, in. Grandfathered this is this does not affect Anclote Harbor I mentioned that because it's taken so long there have been some builders that have been complaining they want to come in but they can't get in with the city and I've told them to come straight to our city manager and there are some that have had permits but like I said things are so expensive they can't get uh, material I just want to make sure that they're all protected if this comes in and is passed. So what would be your cutoff date for these people, these developments? Case by case situation. Mm. We may have problems with that, I don't know, thank you. Um, any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay. Uh, Commissioner comments, uh, anybody? Yeah. Yes, Vice Mayor Lund. Um, as everybody knows, I, I'm not a real big fan of conditionals, period. Open-ended conditionals like this, where somebody can trigger one just by putting an application in, is just it's a miscarriage of, of, of what we're doing and it should be stopped. Um, as far as the issue of having to delay your permit application or, and so forth and so on because of current circumstances, the fallback for that is just to basically reapply. If it was approved in the first place, it's not likely to be unapproved in the second place. So I don't see that as an over, overly large concern for for people being wanting to develop within our or redevelop within our town um, as far as we need to craft this out of it we need to do this before October yeah Ms. Vincent's got some ideas on that yeah. she's not here this week by the way or she'd be here this evening uh, Commissioner comments. Uh, Commissioner Kulia, do you want to? Yeah, I'd like to. I just like to see, you know, if uh, permits are issued, then I'd like to see progress, you know, uh, um, done in a timely manner, and, and people to get their projects done. But yeah, I, I don't want to see something sit for uh, infinity until they decide that's, you know, they have the ability to uh, start building or, or go through with their projects. So we, we want to help encourage. That's why we want to try to help out the building department and getting permits issued to help you know push progress in, in a smart way and um, let's hopefully get staff to come up with a good recommendation on, on time limits but you know as people mentioned before people are grandfathered in they're grandfathered in so um, that should address the that you know those topics as well thank you yeah it, it, I mean the good thing is it's not only is it is the city staff going to come up with it, it's going to go through the PNC board Okay. So we'll have them looking at it as well. So go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm in agreement to having um, these things changed, but I would also like to add in um, into this just having our attorney present at any um, developer that has an attorney present to keep that in involved as well so that we don't run into the situation that we have in the past where 
we didn't have a attorney present and other developers did. So I'd like to add that in as well, but this can all be discussed. Yeah, that's um, the, the answer to that is yes, I understand. And, and um, you're kind of hitting me cold on that because there is the, um, uh, the, the planning department is working up an ordinance that would cause the developer to pay for any consultants that we have there. One of them is like engineers and things. Well, we like do that. have that policy in effect now. That, that's already they did that informally, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. That's already in effect now. As some of them, the attorney have been unhappy about. Just checking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is in place. Yeah. It's been in place. Thank you, Commissioner Kulianis. Yeah, I I agree. It definitely have to have uh, limits on these permits. Um, you know what I don't want to see is people pulling permits and to create value for property that they don't intend to ever develop themselves and flip because we're, um, you know, we're, we're approving things based on, an, on a particular applicant and then it turns out somebody else gets the project and they flip and leave. So we definitely, you know, want some time limits on that. And um, I would suspect that the special consul report would also deal with you know, the, the issue you brought up, I would think that's something uh, that would be in there as well. So thank you. Yeah, I, 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 the answer, there's some other nuances to that. For example, in the swift mud permits, a permit will not be issued to the applicant unless they provide op, uh, uh, evidence that they actually own the property. We don't have that requirement. We just, you know, we can issue a building permit to an applicant even though the owner is not the one that is going to be doing this work. It would be the applicant, and part of the deal would be the applicant would be purchasing the land at some point in the future, which gets back to what you were saying, is that we've added value to that contract that that developer has with the owner. That developer can now unless there's some provision that doesn't allow that between the owner and the developer, that developer can go ahead and flip that contract for X number of more money than what the sale price was originally for that. That you're right. So um, we'll, we'll, city manager will, I'm sure Renee will probably listen to all of this and. Yeah, she, she did a fast, knowing that she, she had to go, you know, back home for the week, uh, deal with the situation. She wasn't going to be here this week. She worked on Friday and got with me. And she's, we've got a game plan set up. If you approve that direction tonight, uh, the game plan will get us in plenty of time for the, the time limit we talked about. So all we need is your, we've already talked about it. She's got a preliminary draw it up. She'll work with the attorneys to refine it on the things that were mentioned. And we're well within, if we get the approval tonight, we're well within timelines to be able to bring that forward to you and get that done. Well, so if I may ask the commission to, uh, let's do the motions one at a time. The one for the um, requiring directing staff for putting in a, a, um, uh, a time requirement for the, um, uh, the expiration of a development um, as part of the development agreement if we can just have that as it's written right then. And then the second motion would be the recommendation to come back with an amendment to the land development code. I want to say prior to October 1st, but for the second reading to occur prior to second, is that the second, the second reading to occur prior to October 1st? Is that a, yes. okay. So let, let's have a motion. If I may ask for a motion to, um, direct the city staff to include an expiration uh, time with any development, future development agreement between now and the time we amend the uh, ordinance. So you want the uh, motion authorize city staff to create an amendment to the land development code that establishes a maximum time limit? Yes, but for the second reading prior to October 1st. So moved, you got it. That's the second one, but we'll do that one first. <laughs> so is there a second? Second. All right. If there's no further comments, roll call, please. Uh, this Cooley. one's getting me a little confused too, but thank you. But go ahead, roll call. Mr. Yes. 
Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vadkiris? Yes. Commissioner Eisner, would you like to help us out with the second one? Uh, I'll do my best. Okay. Um, motion two would be while waiting for the Land Development Code amendment that addresses development project time limits, direct st city staff to ensure an implementation time limit based on the staff's rationale is included in all development agreements. That second. Pardon me? It's second. That was his motion, second. right? <laughs> okay. I just seconded that. All right. If there's no further comments, roll call. Commissioner Kulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vadikiris? Yes. Is that it? I believe so. Okay. That's pretty good. We were estimated to finish at 1025. All right. Um, let's go to um, board and staff comments. Um, Chief Young. The other Chief Young. So just there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Salzman. No comment. City Manager, of course. I just want to say that Y'all were there and involved the 4th of July from the fireworks to the picnic. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was well received. Y'all were there and saw the happiness. You saw the crowd on, on Tuesday at the picnic that we even anticipated a bigger crowd because we said we were going to make it bigger because of the change of fireworks. Um, it was even bigger than that and we ran out of food. So we'll be ready because I think we've set the bar of a standard we have to do next year. So all the totality of the events and a lot of the city employees who who came during that time to, to pull it off. I give them a lot of credit Absolutely. for that. You saw them all out there um, working on, on, on the, the days and of course, you know, the fireworks and trying to get all those people off the west side of town. After that, police had that went smoothly, the whole event fireworks, and which would, could have been a disaster of a 4th of July because of circumstances beyond our control. I think it was a great time for the community and the community enjoyed it. So I want to thank all my staff who worked hard, fire department for getting the permits in time with some of the hitches, everybody who worked on it in the city, which was many different departments. I want to give publicly give their thanks for pulling it off and having such a good event for the citizens. It was very nice. Uh, city Clerk Jacobs, nothing, okay. Uh, Commissioner Koulianis. I, know, I, de I definitely want to thank um, Sorry. Mr. LaCours for uh, uh, a great week. I know you orchestrated all that. However, it wasn't perfect because there was the, um, the Lee Greenwood scandal of 2023. Um, so I, I think I need to address this and apology to, to my colleague and close friend, uh, Commissioner Koulias. You know, I, I, I had to do the presentation out at the, um, at the, the, the <laughs> at Sunset Beach, you know, for the concert and it, the, the young lady from the rec department, she said, you know, are you Commissioner Koulias? I said, no, I'm Koulianis, that's the other guy. And um, she, uh, she says, okay. But then when she announced me, she goes, it, Commissioner Koulias. <laughs> She hands me a microphone. I'm like, okay, I'm good with this. Um, you know, then I do my little spiel. Um, she, I give the microphone back. She asks everybody to turn around, face the flag. I take my hat off. I put it over my heart. Lee Greenwood comes on. <laughs> I'm proud to be an American. And, um, but it wasn't the national anthem. It's like, I'm, I don't know, do I keep my hand over my heart for Lee Greenwood? I'm not sure you do that, right? So. <laughs> So that, you know, it was confusing. Um, as a matter of fact, when the music stopped, there were people singing, <laughs> still singing the national anthem. Uh, you know, I had to get up early in the morning for, um, you know, just drink a little bit too much water, about 1.30. Uh, I, I make a mistake, look at my phone. There's an email. Uh, and it's addressed <laughs> to, <laughs> it's addressed to <laughs> Mr. Koulias <laughs> that, uh, um, that he, you know, has, doesn't respect the flag and the, the national anthem. <laughs> and I, I was laughing like I'm laughing now because they blamed him <laughs> and he wasn't even there. So anyways, to always be known as the Lee Greenwood scandal of 2023. <laughs> oh man. 
That's it. <laughs> well, we've solved that problem. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how, but no, I, it, it's, it happens. So, Commissioner Eisner. <clears throat> yeah, I, I got that same email, and I was down around that way, and I, I didn't see it being a big problem, but, you know, I guess if we get a complaint, we kind of have to do the right thing. So We, we answered it. Yeah. Um, I did want to thank... Uh, you know, Mark and all of your staff at Fourth of July party. Other than the heat, it was uh, it was amazing. It was really nice. I, I heard nothing but good comments from everyone. So I do want to thank you because I know a lot of hard work went into it, and it was a very very warm day. Um, I did also. Um, I shared. I was with the vice mayor at the juvenile. Uh, welfare board uh, school bus that uh, book bus and uh, I'll tell you something seeing these kids faces coming in and getting free books and it was an amazing little uh, event it was a really nice thing to do and uh, I loved every minute of it um, I was also at the library for the presentation from uh, Craig and Megan and we had a, a large group there. It was really nice. Um, you know, they uh, spoke about the well, the presentation we got, the hurricane uh, preparedness, and uh, I think it was just it was a good thing to have it uh, presented to the uh, residents as well because not everybody gets to see this. So we're just doing a lot of good things here and a lot of good information to the uh, residents and just. Keep up the good work. I, I love every minute of it, and thank you. And they even gave me a flashlight and a whistle. So, so. <laughs> okay. So I'm I'm going to chime in and, and as well uh, congratulate the city manager and the staff on on the Fourth of July picnic. It was great. Um, I know there was a little concern about having fireworks that apparently ran depending on where you live in the city for four days, but <laughs> that's not much we could do about that. That typically happens anyway, so it's not a, you know, it's not something we could do about it. Um, as far as Anthem Gate, <laughs> I, I think uh, Commissioner Culliano should uh, start being able to do some acapella. <laughs> and, uh, one of the or two of the residents I talked with at the sustainability meeting the other night mentioned something that might be a change to our procedure for our meetings, uh, but might be a welcome change. I mean, we, we try to reach out to people with Connect Tarpon and with some Facebook stuff and so forth and so on. Sometimes we miss them, but people still do watch our meetings. So what I'm gonna propose is that we consider having an announcement period um, at some point in time, probably earlier on in the evening, where we can actually, because we get lists of, here's the public meetings going on uh, for the next while, that we could announce there's a sustainability meeting and this is what they're going to discuss for the public, and this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that would be a good idea, it would just be one more avenue to get the public aware and involved. Otherwise not, thank you. Have a good okay. evening. Commissioner Kudias. Uh, it, it was a great 4th of, July, uh, Fourth of July weekend. I just want to thank city staff and everyone involved who helped uh, let freedom ring here in Tarpon Springs. And I, I just want to remind the board of this uh, memorandum requesting my excused absence for the regular session, next regular session meeting. Yeah, I'm going to get to that, okay. yeah. Um, is, is there anything else? Commissioner Kudias. That's it. Uh, Thank okay, you. Yeah. Let's take care of that first. Uh, we received a, a memorandum from Commissioner Kudias. He's going to be out of town. Um, what was it? July 20. I've got the date. Uh, July 25th um, on a land long planned trip out of town. He's not going to be here. If I could get a motion, excuse me. I make a motion. Me. We accept uh, Commissioner Kudias's uh, excused absence. excused absence for the 25th. Is there July. a second? Second. Okay. Uh, are there any commission comments? Um, you don't want to do all the dates at once? No, we're just going to do regular session. Our rules of procedure is regular session, 
the work sessions and things like that, though. I want to just make sure we're correct. Two regular meetings. That's called. regular session, not the work. Okay, I just want to make sure. No, no, we're I, we've, we're <laughs> believe me, we've gone through this in a very painful way, so I know what we're talking about. That's okay. two regular meetings. Trying to be careful. Be on excuse. The other thing I want to mention is this something that Commissioner Cuyas should well, be voting on. Yeah, probably not. Okay. You need to recuse yourself from this item because it's, it's an excuse. It, yeah, it's in abundance right. of caution. No excuse right? for it. Right. So okay. Right. If there's no further comments, roll call. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? No. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikaris? Yes. Okay. Uh, the other item is I also wish to uh, congratulate the city manager and the staff for an excellent uh, 4th of July picnic. Mm -hmm. Also want to thank Waste Management who contributed $5,000 for that event. 5,000, is that correct? Yes. And that was part of our contract with Waste Management that they'd been doing that since we went from our own trash trucks back in the 90s to hiring them. And they've done that every, I think every year since then. Yeah, yeah, so it, it was a very nice event. They were there with their, they were in the booth with the icy, the snow cones and things like that and then we did the rest with our guys, so yes. I very much appreciate that. Um, also, um, you know, tonight um, there, there was a little bantering between Mr. Koulianis and myself, and I just want to make sure that it's just bantering. And we're friends, longtime friends. We're going to continue being, I, I hope we're going to be continue <laughs> being friends. Uh, but it's not we the first time be. we've bantered. And Pardon me? It, it, this may be the first time we've bantered this hard. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, on, he and, on, we're with all, the, he with and the microphone, the, but we we've bantered many times out in out in the, yeah, we're, the other we're world. So really, uh, on the same page, I, we're I know here we for are. the residents and everything. Yeah. And I think if there was time for a little further discussion, I think we both realize we're talking about the same thing. So, um, and and um, and that's all I want to say about that. So, um, the. Um, the other thing too, um, we've got, there, there's a couple of things. It, it's actually just a little house cleaning. Um, with um, August 11th, we've got an evidentiary hearing concerning the um, Trask uh, Section Y19 action, which is a complaint against our public records process. And that's August 11th. And um, there's a, um, uh, I wanted to ask Mr. Salzman if he could explain what an evidentiary hearing is and, and what the outcome of that is and, and maybe some helpful information. So uh, August 11th, let me step back. Florida Statute 119, which is the public records um, statute, requires an expedited hearing on any request for documents that an individual either claims um, should have been received or didn't receive, were redacted, shouldn't have been redacted, were privileged, weren't privileged, so um, the hearing is supposed to be expedited. The hearing is August 11th. I don't know if you want to consider that expedited, but um, it, it's, in essence, is pretty much the complaint as alleged. So they have the burden of showing that for s several issues. One, that uh, possibly we didn't bring all the documents to them which we don't believe is a, a correct. Um, number two, that there was an unfair delay, which again, as those of you that are familiar, we had re requests that were pretty voluminous and then we had changes in requests. Uh, and then we had, still had requests which were voluminous and uh, we also didn't get payment uh, as is necessary. So uh, it is our position that those things occurred and that's why the delay was. Um, so it is an evidentiary hearing, which is taking evidence, uh, either sworn or written evidence that has been uh, sworn to uh, for the judge to make a decision. The judge's decision would be uh, there are documents out there that weren't presented and he would either do an order saying that they may be, need to be presented between X, uh, X time period. The judge could say that um, um, Perhaps there needs to be an in-camera inspection of uh, some type of either devices where we didn't give uh, particular uh, responses. Again, I, I'm unaware of any responses that we didn't give. So uh, that's what will happen. 
Uh, it is our, we intend on calling Irene and Michelle to explain the whole process. They have prepared a timeline. Um, so we will go through all that testimony and you know, the, what the process was. So that will occur um, in front of Judge Jurotka on the 11th. Is there any um, restriction for, I, I know some residents have already told me they were planning on being there, but as far as the commission goes, if any commissioner wishes to go, is that? You can absolutely go, it's a public hearing. Uh, but as available. far as any witnesses in the future or whatever that? I'm not concerned about that. Okay, so they can go if they want right. to, okay. Um, and, and then uh, I mean there'll be a court reporter who will take everything down so the purpose the reason why I'm saying that is is that it's all becomes a public record anyway right okay um, but we whoever goes is just going to be observing anyway there's no correct I mean I'm not intending at, as we sit here today I mean obviously I have a month um, I'm not intending on calling anybody else okay uh, maybe my discussions with Irene might change that but right now, we've already talked about it uh, just briefly, and that's my intention. Okay. Um, okay. And I was just thinking if there was something else along that line. Uh, I think that it was one other item along that um, line, but um, it, it's something that... Um, oh, you, you asked if we need to have a shade meeting. We, I, I think, yeah, I asked uh, Mr. Salzman because a couple of people are going to be out of town in August and whether we needed a shade meeting and we would do that sooner than later. And, right. And, uh, I, I don't believe we need a shade meeting in this particular uh, circumstances. Normally a shade meeting is to get direction on how, how to handle the situation and or a settlement of a pending case. I, at this point, I, I don't think it's one that would be subject sure. to settlement. Um, again, we believe that we've provided all documentation, and if we haven't, um, it's, you know, there, there would be some basis or reason that we haven't. We've, everything that we've had, we've provided. So um, that, that would be the position we're taking. I firmly believe that there'll be an argument on their behalf that the delays were unreasonable. The delays are based on the facts, so that's up to the judge to decide. Make that decision. Yeah. Um, do any of the commissioners have any questions for Mr. Salzman, or do you want to do that offline? If y'all do have any questions, contact you can add, me. Right. Okay. As any kind of update I give you, please contact me uh, directly. <sighs> okay. I think we're done. Okay, I just, I know there's something, but I'm, I can take it up privately if we need to. I'm gonna adjourn the meeting at 1014, adjourned.